if you have some issue then you can ask mr sunil to play your video and you can talk from your end okay okay dr ravi krishna has two okay We are live. Uh, very good evening to one and all of you. And uh, we look forward to yet again a very interesting ARC uh, webinar. And this time it's Top Pearls in Cataract Surgery. Uh, it, we have a very interesting set of expert panel, very good speakers, amazing videos. And I promise you the next three hours is going to be full. Hey, uh, can you please unmute yourself? And mute yourself, whoever is talking Don't while others are on. Yeah. So uh, on our expert panel, we have Dr. Ram Murthy, who's the chairman of the Eye Foundation Group of his Hospitals and also the past president of uh, AIOS. And uh, uh, we are truly thankful to have him with us, joining us soon. Joined, uh, joining us is also Dr. Parul Sharma, who's the director and the head of the department of eye care of pulmonology uh, max super specialty hospital gurga and uh, we are enlightened to have we have dr parul we have with us dr krishan prasad who's again a, uh, one of the directors and a consultant in glaucoma squint oculoplasty refractive surgery i don't know whether i have to say retina also i'm holding back but he's one amazing uh, surgeon so prolific in what he does and I'm sure he's going to have us all on our toes with all his questions and answers. We are very lucky to have with us a young, handsome, dynamic, very capable surgeon, Dr. Narayan Chetty, who heads the Department of Cataract and Refractive Lens Serv Services, and also, also is the Vice Chairman of the Narayan Netralia Group of Hospitals. And we are happy to have you with us, Dr. Narayan. Joining us soon is going to be Dr. G.K. Venkatesh, who is a senior cataract consultant consultant from Nagar and Netralia at Rajaji Nagar and he is also a terrific surgeon and you know he's just going to add that extra asset of quality to this webinar. John who has joined us now is Dr. Suvera Jain who's also uh, uh, heads her uh, uh, a charitable hospital at uh, KG Bacholi Eye Hospital in Parel and is a consultant senior consultant cataract refractive and cornea and is a terrific surgeon and has innumerable, uh, very committed uh, students who have learned from her and who have become great surgeons in their respective uh, areas. Moderating with me is Dr. Satyajit Sinha, who's the chairman of and medical director of the ABI Hospital based at Patna. He's a cataract cornea and refractive surgeon. And more importantly, he is also the member ARC East for the second term. He's actually a quite a dynamic national figure, very popular personality, and I'm truly lucky to have him as my ARC team, team player. And uh, with all of this, we shall now go on to start off this very interesting session with our first speaker, Dr. Subodh Purohit, who is a, a senior consultant from Drishti Eye Care at Yavatmal, Maharashtra, and he's going to be showing us his very interesting video. On to you, doctor. Thank you, ma'am, for my introduction and allowing me to speak on this uh, prestigious academic research committee. And the purpose of uh, uh, my purpose of showing this video is not teaching anybody, but learning from you great stalwarts. You see, just. So here, this is my posterior polar cataract. This is a simple, uh, this is a routine posterior polar cataract, but I'm just showing few tips, which I do while doing my posterior polar cataract. As you can see here, I'm doing a CCC, a uh, little bit different from the normal CCCs. I make it slightly oval. The reason for this are two reasons. One is that uh, while doing a central trench, I get larger area to uh, dissect in two ways and number two is if at all if there is any mishap or in PCR then is there is a space for uh, 
uh, sulcus uh, placement for my lens. And also it is easy to remove the uh, 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 epinucleus and cortex. This is hydrodelination, which we all know uh, we should never rotate the nucleus in this posterior polar cataract, as you can see here. Now I'm doing the trenching. First I'm going in a pre faco mode and debulking the nucleus. Then I'm doing the trenching uh, vertical as we do in routine, uh, routine cataracts. The difference in this posterior polar cataract is only a little bit like we can't rotate it. So in the same position, I'm doing trenching, horizontal trenching without rotating the nucleus. Just I'm making the plus sign, but without rotating it because the posterior capsule may be attached and we, we may uh, do a PCR. So now I'm separating in the same position without trying, uh, without rotating the nucleus. I'm making four quadrants. Uh, usually the posterior polar cataracts are very soft cataracts, but sometimes they are hard. They need to be uh, removed uh, in a quadrant uh, mode, uh, as in the routine case. Now here, uh, as you can see here, I'm going in epinucleus mode. First, that's why there's a little bit of time. First, I'm holding with the epinucleus mode just to pull the uh, quadrant in the uh, in the pupillary area. And then I'm, I'll try to eat it up in the central uh, uh, plane as our routine cataract cases. There's no difference in this case. Uh, you just have to uh, keep in mind that you have to maintain the, uh, there should be no fluctuations in the AC. Uh, so I have just dropped the uh, bottle height to around 40 millimeter of mercury in a Centurion machine. And as you can see here, I'm eating it very slowly. Uh, this is a slow motion FACO. I'm doing very slowly. Uh, without uh, causing much of uh, much of uh, AC disturbance, and uh, luckily I got hold of all the four pieces, and then I I'm trying to just eat it up in the central plane. I'm not doing anything in a in a hurry. Another important point is like anytime you should not remove both the uh, like handpiece or handpiece immediately out without instilling. So I'm instilling the visco before removal of the handpiece. That's the installation and not installation. Then uh, another after doing that, I'm going for a visco dissection. I'm uh, in, instilling visco between the anterior capsule or the capsule and the cortical matter just to separate the thick epinucleus part. Because still the central thickened uh, posterior capsule is still there. Uh, our posterior epinucleus is still there. Now, slowly I'm trying to remove the cortical matter by manually without uh, causing much of uh, fluctuations in the anterior chamber. And slowly I could remove it very, very clear, uh, very easily. Uh, as there was a visco dissection, the epinucleus came out very easily. And here also you have to keep in mind that you don't have to uh, jump it immediately like without uh, causing the fluctuations in the anterior chamber. Before removing the irrigation cannula, I'm again instilling visco so that the anterior chamber, anterior chamber doesn't collapse. Again, I'm replacing the visco as you can see from in this video. This is just a basic video. You all must be doing it. Just I'm sharing a few tips, which I do it, but the tip starts right before we are going to the OT. You have to consult the patient about the other types of lenses and the complications that would be possible in these lenses. And that's it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for watching this. I in the back. Thanks a lot. Dr. Subo, that was a very interesting uh, video which you showed. Very nicely discussed steps. And even the way you made your four quadrant, that was so logical. And uh, I've actually not seen anybody doing, but that's good. Uh, nice video. Now, uh, let me ask um, um, Dr. Krishna Prasad. Um, now, the, the polar cataract, there is a, a difference uh, uh, in the technique for you. If you are doing a polar cataract with nuclear sclerosis and without nuclear sclerosis, would you differ in your technique in that? I think this is a very pertinent thing that you actually raised, uh, Dr. Chitla. So this is actually a, a, a actually a, a, a blessing cataract. That means this the nucleus sclerosis that this patient had. It was a very brittle cataract. 
I mean, uh, just enough hardness so that it, we could break the, uh, make a nice trench, create a cross. Okay, uh, this is one of the techniques that is usually uh, very uh, easily, you know, possible by the Centurion machine because of the Kelman tip. It can be the sideward movements, but the way he broke it into four pieces was really, you know, it was an excellent uh, demonstration. At the same time, unless you really make that horizontal, the, the perpendicular uh, uh, trench also, you know, in a perfect manner, you can't normally get four pieces so well. The brittleness actually aided this particular step. And uh, this actually would be an easier version of this particular technique. But if the cataract is uh, softer, if it is uh, probably on the softer side, then it may not break like this so easily. It will still have that uh, something like a cheese wiring. It may not really break into four equal distinct pieces. So actually, a uh, uh, polar cataract with a nuclear sclerosis of grade two, three brittleness would be a, an easier uh, combination. A softer cataract, as you said, <laughs> it's very difficult to separate. In that case, you may not really try to actually create four quadrants. You can, actually make, you can actually make a little deeper trench, create at least two hemi-nuclear perfectly well, which is again a difficult task in a soft cataract, and try to catch the, the central bulk of the hemi-nucleus and try to actually lever it out or tire lever it out of the rexis. A oval rexis, as he alluded, would be an... Uh, an advantage in this so that you can actually get the entire hemi nucleus without having to rotate it. So you just have to catch it in the center and try to take it out of the bag. So that would again come with experience and a little bit of, uh, uh, at the same time, I would rather use a thinner cannula to do the hydro delineation. It was a little thicker cannula because sometimes if you have a thicker cannula, sometimes the fluid can actually get into the wrong plane and you may probably have to do it. But in the end, uh, it was, we really do not know. There are many posterior polar cataracts, we take all the precautions and do it. Finally, things go well. And we start doubting whether it's basically, was it a polar cataract in the very beginning itself? Like uh, it may turn out to be a hoax. But at the same yeah. time, you have to consider every such cataract as a polar cataract, unless proved otherwise, because it's always better to take a precaution. So Actually, most of uh, one other uh, thing is, if it is a uh, polar cataract without nuclear sclerosis, you could do a good hydro delineation and get that small endonucleus yeah, out. You can completely and take you it can out. Go and do a visco dissection and get it yes. out. But if it is a polar cataract with a nuclear sclerosis, then without rotating, you have to uh, make angulated chops and get, get one or two, three pieces, get yeah. one piece out. Now, when we talk of this, Suvira, I'm going to ask you one question before we have to move on to. Now, if there is, uh, I would want a uh, briefest of answers so that I can cover a lot of you very <coughs> capable expert panel. Uh, Suvira, would you, if there is one fragment, you, would you think of after in a polar cataract, remove a fragment, create a working space, would you think that you have already debulked some of the nucleus? Would you think of doing a visco dissection now itself? Or would you want the whole nucleus out before you wonder whether you can do a visco dissection? I would certainly remove that one fragment, debulk, and yeah. then work at completing the nucleus disassembly. Yeah. Only then I would do a visco dissection because visco dissection requires space for the epinucleus to come into the anterior chamber. And that's not going to be possible with a fragment there. Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Ramuti, if there is a toric IOL to be placed in a polar cataract, would you go or be overzealous about removing the viscoelastic from behind the IOL? Yeah, or would you leave it? Uh, most often I do uh, um, uh, what hydro implantation have been talking about. Do you do a hydro implantation in a polar cataract? Yeah, I mean, I'm reasonably confident now. My incisions are 2.4 millimeters, and I'm able to uh, have control over the cartridge mouth, and then the quite uh, uh, gradual. So uh, I'm quite confident of doing it. Initial cases, yes, I was not doing it, but nowadays I'm doing that. And the problem of removing viscoelastic is not there once we employ this uh, technique. And also, you are able to exactly position the lens. Uh, under the hydro itself, and the, the surgical time is also significant. Yeah. This is one of the I have. Yes. Yeah. 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 Others can mute. Uh, uh, one observation I have is that nowadays we have made it a point to do a ASOCT in all these cases preoperatively. I mean, it's just one more uh, additional tool, and that helps us to prepare better. You can never be sure about how the case is going to go. 
But in case there is a pre-existent defect, then you are better prepared and you counsel the patient a little more regarding that. And uh, one small tip is that, you know, we keep talking about uh, uh, not removing the handpiece or the aspiration the irrigation cannula without injecting the viscoelastic, uh, before injecting the viscoelastic. But at the same time, the moment you start injecting the viscoelastic, you have to stop the irrigation. Like you saw in your video itself, while you're injecting the uh, viscoelastic was constantly flowing out. So once you are ready with the cannula inside the anterior chamber, stop the irrigation and inject, then only you'll get a good, nice uh, fill. And mm -hmm. everything is well covered. Noted, sir. Uh, while Dr. Rajesh Joshi gets his video connected, uh, Dr. Naren, any one extra tip you will say when you're on the femto cataract platform with the polar cataract? Oh yes, uh, uh, thank you, ma'am. So I think uh, with the femto cataract, you have a you can do a hydro delineation from the femto itself. Uh, so you don't you know what happens is, see if the sclerosis is less, then it's fine. You can delineate, but if the sclerosis mode becomes pretty challenging, that is the advantage in femto. Only in femto you can delineate in these uh, very if it is if the sclerotic component is more. So uh, only the femto can actually create it. And plus, what is important is not to have surge. See, in a centurion, you can go to 40, uh, 20, all those things. That is different, but doesn't mean all machines can. Always remember, always, you should know your machine and make sure the IOP, even if it is high, it is okay. But there shouldn't be any surge because the whiplash action uh, causes the uh, the PCR. So it's very important to me. Is Dr. Rajesh Doshi there? He's not connected yet. Okay. Uh, we'll have to come back to him. Is Dr. Nilesh Jain there? What is happening? Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm, I'm here. Yeah, Dr. Nilesh. Okay. So, Dr. Nilesh, you can get connected. He's a, again a, a, a senior consultant ophthalmologist from BJ Hospital, Gondia, and uh, he's going to show us uh, a challenging case. On to you, Dr. Nilesh. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for, for giving this opportunity to uh, present uh, in front of uh, all dignified members. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'm, I'm start with the, uh, sharing my content. Um, uh, before he starts, can I mention one point, ma'am? Yes. Uh, I mean, everyone's uh, tech, I mean, uh, there's nothing like a perfect technique. Everyone's whatever they're comfortable, they can go ahead. Yes. But, uh, what I normally do is if I hydro delineate, uh, I rotate the nucleus because once you hydro delineate the nucleus separated from the epinucleus and cortex, so actually it won't disturb the posterior capsule. So we can still actually rotate and then uh, eat up the negative lens. That is something before they used to always say don't rotate, but now I think it is okay to rotate. If your your hydrodynamic is good, yes. All. Uh, Ma'am, the anterior segment OCT also can give you a fair idea about the posterior that's what, capsule. That's what Dr. Ramuti was saying. Yes, uh, yes. Satyajit. Anterior segment OCT uh, would definitely uh, be a big uh, uh, boon in this. And um, even intra op OCT, if you are very lucky to have, that takes you even uh, steps forward. Yes, Dr. Nilesh, could you start your play yes. button? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, is uh, like my screen is up there. Yes, we can see the screen, screen yet. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to present a, a video of a, a traumatic cataract. Uh, a 16 year male who, who had a trauma in the left eye because of the nail resulting in a uh, uh, leaking corneal tunnel uh, tear in the 7 to 9 o'clock hours. Along with that, there is a uh, rip apart of anterior capsule in the 7 to 9 o'clock hours. Along with that, there is a flocculent of the cortical matter is there with a minimal cataract. So patient came to me. So that time I did the USG B scan was normal. So I immediately advised him for the surgery. But since patient was uh, poor, so he wanted to go to some uh, government hospital or something like that. And uh, after a few days, he went to another doctor where he diagnosed it to be having corneal infection. So they started with antifungal and antibiotic systemic as well as locally. After 15 or 20 days of the treatment, patient lined up to me with this condition. So when I saw the patient, he was having a sealed corneal tear, sealed uh, sign was negative, and the patient is having an anterior as well as posterior sinicia with a full developed cataract. USG B scan again, it was done, it was normal. So I, uh, um, I, took, I did the counseling of the patient as well as their relatives and explained all the consequences, especially endophthalmitis and resurgeries. And I took the patient for the surgery. So here, the challenge is uh, here, I just wanted to, uh, my plan is to uh, make a removal of the cataract and implantation of the IL, try to be in the back. So when I started with the surgery, so first I made a 12 o'clock uh, side port 
with the help of a uh, side board uh, with mvr blade in a 12 o'clock position and after that i injected air bubble and with the help of cyclodialysis spatula i removed the synechia not only from the cornea but also from the entire capsule then with the help of <clears throat> this is the releasing of the synechia from both the sides hello yes yes keep talking i think my video is got paused yes i don't know why it doctor you can stop and reshare yeah i'll do that again Uh, no, it is not working. No, you I think it's not a downloaded uh, video. It's good. No, it is a downloaded video, sir. It is in the oh, Google sorry. Drive only. Uh, ah, Google Drive. So you need to download it to your laptop and then play it because I can see it buffering because it's downloading and. Uh, uh, Mr. Like Sunil, can you play video. his video? Yes, ma'am. I'll just play. Let <laughs> Mr. Sunil play your video, and you could talk alongside. Not yes. repeat what you can said. continue the, the uh, talking. I think the video can come along. Yes, sir. So after that, I released the synechias uh, from the uh, anterior as well as the posterior surface. And after that, uh, with the uh, I just injected uh, viscoelastic and formed the anterior chamber properly. And after that, with the help of twenty six. This is not the video. No, this is not the video. This is not his video. Doctor Nilesh Jain. Mr. Sunil, you have it, or he has to read. Yeah, yeah, I have it. Just playing. I think, yeah. I just actually. Please, any of you who have network issues, tell Mr. Sunil and get the get him to show, play it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now it is. Yeah, it's working. So everybody is able to see the in my video. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Okay. Talking. So with the help of twenty-six gauge needle, I just made a nick in the entire capsule, and I just raised the flap. And with the help of uh, micro scissor and micro forceps, uh, I just made a uh, rexis and try to extend and uh, merge it with the ruptured entire capsule on the both the sides. So here you can see the video where it is demonstrating that uh, this raised, uh, raised flap is there, and with the help of micro forceps, I am trying to convert it in the rexis to the Joining it to the other part also, and after that, with the help of uh, FACO probe, I just aspirated out all the uh, nuclear material as well as cortical cleanup was done. And after that, I was about to implant the uh, hydrophilic lens. Here, some synechias are still present, so with the help of micro forceps, I just removed the synechias. Now, with the help of uh, FACO probe, I am aspirating the Nuclear material, as well as the leaking cortical matter. A cortical wash was given up, and now while injecting the hydrophilic lens, as soon as the leading haptic was going inside, I can able to see that there is a tear in the uh, posterior capsule also. So immediately, with the help of uh, Sinsky, I just rotated the uh, haptic in the upper part and delivered it into the anterior chamber. So now both the haptics were there in the anterior chamber, and now my plan is to put the both the haptics in the sulcus and that too away from the tear. So after a few minutes of struggling and manipulation, I was able to do so, and finally I just put the lens in the sulcus and away from the tear. the post operative the next day when i saw the patient patient was having a uh, fibrinous membrane because of the repeated marrow work and uh, but there was no infection in the cornea so i decided to start him on topical steroid also and after one week when patient came to me that time patient was improved a lot and his vision was improved to 624 thank you thank you thank you very much uh dr parul i would want you could uh, to ask you a question are you there dr parul yeah i am so, yeah now uh, with this uh, uh, corneal scar uh, how would you plan your biometry uh, maybe this was in a periphery in this case it would have been a routine event 
But if the point mm. scar comes in the little bit into the towards the center, would you have a different action plan? So uh, that's the challenge with all traumatic cataracts and any corneal opacities. So at that time, you have to take help of all your uh, instruments. So mm -hmm. I would take keratometry. I would also go on a manual keratometry. I would also do my optical biometry. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would do my both A scan as well as the optical ones because it will have mm -hmm. to be an average and whatever maximum information I can draw from various instruments because you can't rely on just one um, instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, okay, and then uh, madam, madam, yes? madam, one question, one question. I just wanted to ask, yes. ma'am. Uh, yeah, madam, uh, uh, like suppose this type of patient when came to us with the infection. So, like after cleaning of the infection, after how many days after we can take him for the surgeries? Like uh, all the cell bars are here, so I just wanted to uh, clear my doubts. So we'll, let me just uh, may, uh, uh, finish the first point also that uh, yeah. I will come to your infection point. But yeah. also when there is corneal scar and opacities and sometimes you, even with any equipment, you're not getting good keratometry readings, then I think it's a good idea to take a cue from the other eye. Uh, you do the keratometry of the other eye and then feed in your uh, details because uh, you would just be handicapped in getting captures, good image capture. And yeah. infection control uh, of the cornea, you mean to say when to do the surgery after the infection control? In an yes. active infection? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So I think once the patient has been under the cover of antibiotic uh, drops and there is no active infection, uh, traumatic no cataracts, you will have to negative. see. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if the cedar is negative, it's a good time to uh, go ahead. I mean, you wouldn't uh, wait too long also. And Especially it's very important. Especially the anterior in capsule is ruptured, no, Dr. Yeah. Parul? Yeah. yeah. So because you're anyways going to have a lot of inflammation, secondary uveitis, secondary glaucomas, these patients, you also have to look at their eye pressures and look at their gonioscopy to see what has happened to the angles because secondary glaucoma and secondary uveitis is pretty uh, common and very well uh, managed, uh, Dr. Nilesh, very well managed surgery. And it's a good point to bring out here that in any kind of traumatic cataract, I think the micro instruments are a big uh, help. So always be ready with micro vitreous for step, always be ready with micro scissors because you can easily manage all kinds of capsular tears extension with these uh, micro equipment to have visco, to have helon, to have your dyes. I mean, you were very well prepared in everything. So it's yes. a good take home to keep your, you know, instruments ready within uh, to be ready for any kind of surprises. Dr. Venkatesh, are you there? Dr. Venkatesh has not joined in. Uh, then, um, uh, I have a okay. point, Dr. Chitla. Yes, yes, uh, Dr. Actually, the here we are. We should not miss the elephant in the room. Yes. When you have an injury which is such a large corneal, you know, uh, entry and yeah. the anterior capsule being, and that too in the periphery where the thickness of the lens is lesser compared to the center, there's always a chance of pre-existing posterior capsular injury or damage. In or fact, I think any traumatic cataract. I don't think we should be doing a hydro at all. Unless you have done an ASOCT and you feel that the anterior cap posterior capsule is intact, if you have not done that step, I think uh, we should definitely avoid doing a hydro because uh, we are not sure about the thing as you had mentioned. But in this case, it was a peripheral one and a large one. And you probably if you ask the history exactly what hit the eye and how long, I mean, what are the force, we may actually yeah. sometimes, you know, get an idea. We can conjure up what could be the actual damage. And every case should be, as Dr. Chitra said, should be taken. It's like a posterior polar cataract where you already know that there's a PC rent. So right. you have to really yes. handle, and yes. most of them um, will be soft cataract, already swollen one. cataract. So it may not be very difficult for us to actually remove the contents of the bag without having to do any further, you know, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, enlargement of the existing rent. I think here that yeah. is something. So you should be actually be ready. So here we had put a hydrophilic uh, uh, you know, a single piece lens. I would rather at any point of time plan for a three piece, three uh, piece. hydrophobic three. lens in the sulcus right. with the haptics sure. perpendicular to it. And maybe we can try to uh, capture the optic if possible. Because if you have a PC, it normally tends to enlarge. And the time frame is also important. There have been studies to show that somewhere if you wait for two, three weeks more, probably in a in situation where you can wait, if the lens is not swollen, we can wait. Then probably the edges of the PC rent actually fibrose and they actually, they don't enlarge. But a fresh 
case like this, within few days, if you try to do any kind of a manipulation, normally it extends. So you should be mentally prepared to place the lens in the sulcus and you should have the readiness for it. So that is something that uh, we all should actually take home in an yes. ideal situation. May yes. I ask, Rain, you wanted to say something, Subera also wanted to say, but be very brief. We yes, have many surgeons here. Absolutely. I totally agree with the Krishna Pratha sir about the three piece. Uh, if it's available, please put a three piece. Uh, that would uh, really be already it's an when would you differ? When would you differ placing an IOL in the first instance? If you don't have a three piece and there is no guy. It's good to put not a three in this piece. particular case. In a case of traumatic cataract, when would you not want to place an IOL in the first instance? Since um, I thought I, we covered I, up it. I, I would always put it, ma'am, if it's possible, because if everything is okay, you're finished, the bag is intact, I would always put it. So unless you uh, think there's a retained intraocular foreign yes. body, uh, or there is a... Complication. We have a complication. Yes. Yes. Sir. But if your biometry is absolutely unreliable. Mm -hmm. oh. So if there is a very... So if it is incision, a... Depending on where the opacity... Yeah. If, where the opacity of the cornea is, you can plan your main incision so that the place where you're chopping your pieces, it's more clear. So always try to do worst come worst situation. Uh, you can turn off all the lights, put an endo illumination. Uh, that will uh, give you a lot more visibility if the visibility is very low. Should we put compression switches? Dr. Chitra, good evening. One yeah. question. Should we put compression switches to the corneal wound to this reduce the plastic Who is this? Dr. Jay Prasad. Oh, okay. Um, compression. This is a self sealed wound and uh, it was not leaky, sealed, negative. Why would you want to unnecessarily go touch that scar at all? Yes, uh, Suveda, what did you want to say? So I want to say just two things. One is exactly about this corneal tear. The corneal tear is not more than 10 to 12 or 14 days old. There still yeah. is an element of weakness. It might be sealed by some amount of fibrous material and stuff. But very often in a tear that's even, unless if it's just a millimeter large or, so, or if it's anything slightly larger, I would go in and freshen the edges and take sutures. Because even in grafts, trauma can disrupt it. So I would want to strengthen this wound. And the second point I would say is that there has been more than one instant when I've had a large central tear with a cornea, with a, with a cataract, even with a disrupted capsule. If you have a large central tear obscuring visibility, you're still a lot better off not dealing with the cataract at that situation. You manage the inflammation, you manage the pressures. A couple of weeks later, when you have more visibility, then you go and address the cataract with, an, with a three-piece IOL, your chances of a better outcome followed by a scleral lens later on to take care of the induced astigmatism and the scar-related visual loss are a lot better. That has been my experience. I do agree with you, okay. Ramuti. Yeah, just a quick point. Quite a very good points have been made. I would just say that, you know, the first incision that you made seemed to be slightly large. I mean, it was happening with a blade and I think that makes the, you're already in a difficult situation it gives you an incision which could be leaky. The second is the last point is that you have lost, a, uh, you have a PCR, it was a, a um, traumatic cataract. I think you should always drive home the point that a final check by injecting diluted that ramstone estate is important to make sure there are no vitreous I didn't see that happening. Uh, yeah. Get away with it, but then uh, even if you think that uh, there's no vitreous loss, as a final thing, it's always a good idea to do that. Yes, yes. And I am all Dr. Rajesh, would you want to day. share your video? Yeah, yeah, sure, madam. Sure, madam. In fact, uh, you are connected, are... Dr. Rajesh? Yeah, yeah, I am connected, I suppose. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, but I think my you have some network weakened, issues. So I, will may, I may uh, switch up my video. Dr. Rajesh is presently the associate professor and heads the department uh, for Government Medical yes, College yes. at Nagpur with a a uh, huge teaching experience and a very capable surgeon. And he's going to show us another interesting video. Definitely an interesting video. And let's have a lot of discussions on this. On to you, Rajesh. Yeah, thank you so much, madam, for the opportunity. In fact, there are uh, three videos if I exceed the time. Uh, I just so you have to be in your four minutes. Yeah, sure, sure. If I exceed, just stop me, okay? So uh, this is a rare situation, particularly in the urban area. But in rural area, this is a common situation particularly with long-standing cataract and they are associated with zonal weakness 
and very hard uh, cataract so what are the difficulties uh, which are encountered in this situation capsular exits is uh, everyone knows it's an important uh, part of the cataract surgery and uh, it should be perfect in each and every situation may be a soft hard or whatever type of cataract it could be so staining needle vanas and micro scissors these are the important part of the trolley which you have for the cataract surgery and of course the nucleus management and you expect surprise during any step of the surgery so case one is a 70 year old male uh, presented with accurate perception of light and projection of ray and other i had a mature cat cataract and rest ocular examination was normal so this was uh, the appearance on the table and i wish i will start with the video so uh, uh, usually i take uh, i operate from the temporal side this is the staining with the trifam glue and the clear corneal incision so it's hard to pierce the capsule so i am using 26 gauge bent needle and removing this capsule in fact this is the edited video and bit uh, fast forward so it may look little bit easy but while performing the capsular exits uh, i had a lot of difficulties and i had to use vana scissor and in an attempt to do all these things i must have caused zonal weakness so whether to put into capsular ring or not that was dilemma but i thought it's better to put into capsular ring first and then go for the cataract surgery rather than repainting later on so i implanted into capsular ring and then went away for nucleus removal so nucleus was chopped into pieces i use chop technique for nucleus management so this is how the nucleus was out so implanted hydrophilic iol into the capsular bag but still a lot of rim was there of thick entry capsule so i thought i will peel off the rim so there was sufficient entry capsule and the glow was good so irrigation and aspiration of the remaining cortex cortex was done now sometimes it happens that the cortex remains inside the bag at the equatorial area so it's always better to wash this cortex pro cortex properly second uh, so tips for this is need good micro scissor and forceps for ccc in such situation and of course ctr implantation i'm not sure whether uh, other panelists they will agree it agree it or not but i feel it's better to implant in uh, capsular tension ring for the support of the zonules and the chop technique as it puts less stress on the zonules zepto or fem femto i am not sure uh, because i don't have experience with these techniques this was the post of follow up of the patient case 2 65 or year old female presented with pain redness watering of left eye other eye was sodophakic iop on presentation was 47 mm diagnosed having faecalitic glaucoma after control of pressure patient was taken for cataract surgery and this is how you can see the tough entry capsule with calcified uh, entry capsule and the sinking nucleus into the back so the capsular exits was done capsular exits was not a problem but what the management of the nucleus was bit difficult as the nucleus was moving so the bevel down tip was used for holding the nucleus and chopping the nucleus into pieces but there wasn't any cushion between the nucleus and between the posterior capsule and the probe so this was the situation how panelist they go about this situation i would like to know about this do i have time uh, no no okay fine thank so you very good videos you have shown uh, i mean wonderful videos and uh, um, uh, if you stop sharing we would take the discussion um, yeah. um the first thing i wanted to uh, 
bring to the minds of the expert panel was this was not uh, actually uh, only fibrosis. There was a subcapsular plaque there. So there's a beautiful video of Deepak Meghur. Some of us would have seen it. How he uh, starts the rexis and then he separates the subcapsular plaque from the uh, below the rexis, removes it, and then very easily is able to complete the rexis. This was this particular case was not uh, just uh, that uh, fibrous capsule alone. There was a, a subcapsular plaque along with it. So I would want your thoughts on that. The other in question I wanted was: Would any of you? would have thought of using a vitrector for this uh, particular case or would you have also stuck to it? Yes, Dr. Narin. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. I was about to just say the same. Uh, yeah. It's a much, much simpler technique. I mean, not a single fibrosis in one region. If it is single fibrosis, better use a uh, micro scissors and cut it. Mm -hmm. But if it's a fibrosis, like you mentioned, like a, a complete plaque mm -hmm. below the capsule also, and yeah. you need a lot of talent and skills to separate the two. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not possible to separate it also. So that way, actually, what you can do is you do a FACO punch technique in the center. You can't even punch, punch it sometimes. It is so thick. So you do your FACO punch uh, technique in the center. After you've done that, you take your cutter but do not uh, do not forget to fill uh, the bag once you have done the fico punch fill the bag with uh, viscoelastic and then start your cutting because sometimes there'll be a lot of uh, uh, there can be a morgangi cataract behind and the posterior capsule might be flopping uh, so it's good to fill the chamber uh, i mean fill the capsule with the viscoelastic and use a cutter to extend the uh, the rexis and believe me this rexis with the cutter also it's so strong it's just like a normal ccc itself Absolutely. I think uh, I think this kind of capsule will not run away. You know, this kind of extensive fibrosis Absolutely, will allow manipulations on this uh, kind of a thing. And exactly. uh, I do I think what using a CTR in this particular case was not at all a wrong thought. I mean, because he yes. must have expected a lot of uh, challenges along the way, and putting it there is not a bad idea. I think yes. the CTR, oh. there are a lot of been confusions about CTR. We always tell the postgraduate CTR should be inserted okay, as early as you should and as late as you can. It's just a wordplay. But I feel that the, the only uh, way by which we delay the CTR, maybe the only one I can think of is in case of a, an early cataract with a lot of cortex, where you actually it holds the cortex in the capsule of fornix, it may be difficult for us to remove the uh, cortical fibers if there is a CTR holding it up to fornix. But this was almost a, a mature cataract. You don't expect any cortical fibers to be sticking up there in the fornices. So I think putting a CTR, the timing doesn't really matter. And I really do not know, Dr. Rajesh, whether how was the zonular integrity? We could not really, yeah. I mean, you're a surgeon. If it is weak, probably then the CTR would be probably required. You can put it at any stage, early or late, it doesn't really matter. But no, it was a very is... fabulously done case. You yes. showed the very importance of the uh, chop technique instead of doing any four quadrant or any kind of a trench chop would be a highly zonal friendly situation mm -hmm. and the second one we do also a lot of uh, glaucoma surgeries with cataract like what you showed the only trouble i expect in such case the pc is too you know uh, fragile and too patulous and it can be sucked into the probe very easily so whatever mm -hmm. could be the machine even with centurions you would have had you know tragedies with the uh, hyper mature cataract you know uh, the Morgagnian one, where we normally have to do slightly a larger axis, almost bring it up in the pupillary plane and then probably chop it rather than anything in the bag. Any in the bag manipulation would be asking for trouble. And also try to be very careful about the PC, which can be sucked up into the port anytime. Very yes, nice video, Rajesh. I mean, uh, yeah. just a couple of points I want to make is that, as was mentioned, a vitrector is a great way to create a nice capsule axis and these uh, uh, is such a fibrous capsule that it doesn't have a tendency to run off. And you also asked specifically about the application of uh, femtosecond laser in this. Uh, it doesn't really, you don't get a free floating rexis or anything, but it often creates a nice template. And uh, after you have done that, uh, you can go ahead and with your conventional uh, bent needle, go ahead and separate the uh, rexis and then go Go on with the surgery as you did. You very this nice kind of fibrosis. I'm not sure whether femto cataract. Well, yeah, we have done that. We have a video on that also. I mean, it's not that as if it's a free floating, but you get a nice punched out uh, uh, template, and you are able to uh, get the rexes in a slightly more controlled manner than without it. Of course, he managed very well. 
as regards your second case of krishna prasad also alluded to even today i did a very similar case what i do in these cases to go ahead and put the intraocular lens inside mm -hmm. so it's a single piece lens which goes inside the back and then that acts as a um, iol scaffold and of course it's a fairly hard nucleus so a lot of dispersive viscoelastic and keep refilling and do the phaco at the iris plane but uh, the fact that this uh, is a very fragile capsule and has a tendency to trample it once you have the lens in place that is the uh, helps you to secure the posterior capsule and uh, and we have a, have a terrific team of expert panel but i'm going to keep only two for a case because you know we have a whole set of speakers and it's going to be 6:45 now so please understand and uh, ramurthy are in trouble no no all <laughs> of you even mr dr krishna prasad you are in trouble because both of you actually have to take more time so we are going to go on to our next speaker but lot of valid points you'll tell and you all are true teachers our next speaker is going to be dr pankaj uh, ramesh lande and he is again a uh, uh, senior consultant from sri netralya amravati maharashtra and he is going to show us an interesting case dr pankaj are you there uh, yes ma'am yeah. i'm good evening and thank you so much for having me here uh after seeing such tough cases i'm going to show you a very simple cases and to have uh is my screen visible ma'am yes yeah i'm going to talk on uh, phaco beyond emulsification every time we talk on emulsification but i want to talk on something more than that and that is uh pc polishing and making surgery more perfect so having a perfect surgery and perfect outcome is a target of all the surgeons but whenever we have a posterior capsule opacification we have failed surgeries after months or within one year or two years of duration and there we face issues of pco and patient says that within such short duration i am not able to see so there are uh, reasons like iol related reasons patient related reasons and surgeon related factors for pco formation so we will just discuss few points where we can decrease the chances for pco and get a better outcome so let's see phaco beyond emulsification this is just a routine case i usually use a 5.5 mm rexis marker i uh, want to highlight the use of rexis marker because it gives a perfect circular rexis and have a 5.5 mm size give the advantage that it will cover the optic 360 degree and thereby decreases the chances of pco later in the post operative period secondly i am using a fundal glow while doing my Uh, ccc that gives me extra edge over the routine view a good hydro dissection is extremely important and seeing a hydro wave passing throughout is very essential third is we should rotate our nucleus to free all the fibers from the cortical uh, material and from the capsule i'm skipping the phaco part of this cortex is now taken with the help of here i'm using a coaxial ia probe and a sweeping movement is done so that it will have a larger chunk of cortical material and it will it will be pulled to the, towards the center so that removal of this uh, cortical material will be very easy once this is done uh, with with my phaco uh, means with my hole on upper side i can polish my posterior capsule again the and uh, ac is filled with visco elastic and here i am using a pc polisher this is the shafer's pc polisher which can be which can use uh, for anterior capsule polishing and thereby decreases the chances for phimosis in the post operative period i am just showing right now the importance of having a retro illumination mode now this is a normal mode and as soon as i turn my you can see the cortical material still there cortical fibers now i am using the retro illumination mode here i actually i am using the omniglow 
you can see the fibers attached to the posterior capsule and a bit of chunk there on under the uh, incision which i can very well view once i can view it nicely i can remove it nicely and then again using a cataract mode i can polish my pc here the some of the vitreous membranes are also seen there are floaters in this case but that did, uh, indicates how this retro elimination mode can work well for you and make your things visualize much better to have a perfect outcome you can see it was looking all good and but after anterior capsule polishing so much of anterior epithelial cells has come out this is at another case similar here i am using a slightly different capsule polishing my iol has to be injected before that i am doing it in the initial stage i used to first implant the iol and then do the polishing but now because i am slightly confident of doing it without even implanting the iol i have shown the cases where i have not implanted the iol yet you can very well see the anterior capsule epithelial cells coming out with the pc polisher this is coat singer polisher then visco wash from behind the iol is extremely important to prevent pco formation and this is what is being demonstrated now visco wash behind the iol is quite easy job with bimanual it is still easier with slight practice everybody can do it one can use the sandblasted iol tips or silicon iol tips to do a pc polishing and anterior capsule polishing here i am using a sand blasted iat for same is your video more than 4 minutes uh, slightly ma'am 30 seconds i guess now i have a last step where i am implanting a square edge hydrophobic iol and the, that decreases the chances for pc formation pco formation now i can use my iol as a third hand of a surgeon to polish pc where i cannot go uh, near posterior capsule with the help of ia and in the initial hand, in the initial phase of surgery i think it is better to use iol as a third hand out of sir and as a third hand of a surgeon and just rotate it up and down slightly so that all the material will come out and then you can go behind the iol and remove the remaining viscoelastic that's all ma'am thank you so much thank you dr satyajit are you there not there okay uh, i am going to ask one two line question uh to uh, two of the two three of the expert panel now uh to krish prasad would you do anterior polishing in all your cases with the present iols it's not necessary we were obsessed in the past but not anymore and uh, subera would you like to do what would you like to do extra in a polar cat in a mahai mayo hmm huh? Yes. What extra thing would you want to do in a high myo when to avoid a PCO at uh, later? Would you have any extra thing to do now? If, it's, way... a, if it's a very 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 high myo, I put in a CTR that stretches my bag out fully and gets my posterior aspect of the IOL in contact with the PC. Other than that, I use a very good quality hydrophobic IOL, nothing else, and I make sure I do a good cortical cl uh, clean up. I don't. polish anterior capsules and I'm, I'm i take my time to clear the posterior capsules yes okay, yes barul so i was just <clears throat> making this point which i wrote in the chat that a simple thing which we need to do to clean the pc is also a jet of fluid with your hydro cannula so at the end of everything and in fact you can go behind the lens very safely so especially for beginners or tricky cases if you just use your hydro cannula and you will see the fibers coming off so beautifully with just that jet of hydro cannula you can completely crystal clear your uh, pc or the point was anterior capsule polishing pcs no, no. all agree yeah yeah 
So and for anterior also, I think the bi manual works pretty well because the single cannula is a challenge at your temporal site. So bi manual, good polishing, but I mean we are doing it and doesn't take a long time. I still do it. I still polish my anterior capsules. Dr. Naren or Dr. Ramuti, whoever is ready to answer, is a post silicone oil injection that dense plaque is there. What would you all do in those cases? So please. I usually uh, prefer uh, not to do, uh, uh, when I do my cataract surgery, I don't prefer to open up the uh, posterior capsule uh, because I, I, I feel the eye should become quieter and then do a YAG. We can always do a YAG later because I, I, if we open up the posterior capsule at that point, when you do the cataract surgery, that post cataract surgery, there's some amount of inflammation in the eye. And that inflammation goes seeps into the posterior segment. And then it's it's a big, uh, I mean, I, I personally don't do it. And in terms of anterior capsule polishing, I mean, I definitely do it, especially in the premium IOLs. Um, I feel it's extremely important. And in young patients, please, please, no matter what, always, always polish uh, the anterior capsule in young patients. It's very, very important. Thank you. I, I think, think uh, uh, while uh, doing a silicone oil removal, can't the uh, posterior segment surgeon from behind remove that uh, dense plaque? Mm -hmm. So but if it is a combined, do. if it is combined, definitely, ma'am. If it is not combined, see, sometimes what happens, the oil is there and we just do cataract surgery and it's left, the oil is left for a very long time later. And you will not it, meddle at that. I, I wouldn't touch it at all because later on, when the, uh, in fact, we can either do a YAG or plus when the retina surgeon goes posteriorly to remove the silicone oil, he can always open it. Actually, yes, these capsules are very uh, strongly see? fibrosed uh, once there is silicone oil. And generally, they are not amenable to yak. Earlier, we used to do a posterior capsulotomy and all the silicone oil used to come out. But then our vitreoretina colleagues always say that this evacuation, though the silicone oil comes out, is never complete. And so it's always a good idea to leave it to them to remove the silicone oil. And with the vitreoretina, just as we discussed in the fibrous anterior capsule, they can create a nice controlled posterior capsular opening and have a clear visual axis. As regards uh, polishing the rim of the anterior capsule, one thing we all know is that it has absolutely no role as far as uh, the PC clear is concerned. The PC gets opacified from the cells in the furnaces of the capsule of that. Basically, we polish the rim of the anterior capsule in pediatric cataracts, in cataract, uveitis, in pseudo exfoliation, whenever you have a small rexus and you don't want a phimosis. But otherwise, I mean, when you have a nice 5.5 millimeter excess, a good square edge um, hydrophobic intraocular lens, uh, maybe polishing of the anterior capsule is not even necessary. There have even been studies which shown that when the anterior capsular cells are left intact uh, with a tacky lens inside, the addition of the lens material to the capsular rim is much better when it's not polished. So I personally, yes. though it's always possible, routine polishing of the anterior capsular rim is not something that I do. Yes. We go on to thank you very much, expert panel. We shall go on to our next speaker, Dr. Shubhangi Bhave, who is a senior consultant from Drishti Eye Clinic and Spin Center, Nagpur. We have a lot of Nagpur people in this session, Nagpur and Bangalore. So she is going to show us an interesting case. Yes. Yes, Dr. Shubhangi. Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks ma'am, for asking me to uh, participate in this um, uh, wonderful seminar. We are having a nice discussion on all the uh, cases and everyone has shown very beautiful videos. So I'll be showing two videos of small pupil cataract surgery, one using a BHEX ring and one using iris hooks. So this is... Uh, <clears throat> the uh, surgery. Yeah, sorry. I'll just go back. It, uh, yeah. yeah, this one. So this was a uh, 65, 70 year old female who came with uh, a very hard cataract and a very uh, small pupil. She had a rigid pupil, so we decided to go ahead with this uh, uh, BHEX uh, ring in her case, I think. Oh, yeah. So uh, basically, uh, she was highly hypermetropic also. The IOL power was 
to the tune of uh, 24, 25 uh, diopters. Certain tips while inserting the B-hex ring is, first of all, we insert the OVD behind the iris so it facilitates in uh, putting this ring. And this ring, as you see, have six hooks and uh, six notches and six flanges. The three flanges, which are with the holes, go behind the iris. And the three flanges, which are without the hole, are above the iris. And by doing this, it gives a nice hexagonal opening uh, to the pupil because the iris is fitted in the uh, hooks in the notches and then after that in this case uh, the routine FACO was performed since she had a another important point is to stabilize the globe with a second instrument uh, so that the manipulations which we do are uh, more controlled I do a stop and chop you can see the density of the cataract. It was a very dense cataract. But this much opening was enough to do a good FECO emulsification and implant the iron. Sometimes it is better to use a side port forcep to implant this lens. And this time I didn't have the side port forcep, so I used the main uh, port to use uh, to put the ring. IOL is inserted. Again, removal of this ring is pretty easy. Just disengage it from the iris, bring it over the iris, and then pull through the main port, and, and the ring comes out easily. Then we have the, uh, I have the next uh, video. This was again a small pupil, a 70 year old gentleman who had a, a totally non-dilating uh, pupil. And so we decided to use the iris hooks. Uh, just a, uh, care about using the iris hook is that when we make the side port incision, it should be uh, slightly peripheral and the direction should be slightly downwards so that it doesn't tent up the iris. If there is a tenting up of the iris, then it will cause, it will be damaged uh, during the um, surgery. And <clears throat> I've put a fifth hook at the main incision. Um, so the iris there doesn't tent up and is not damaged by the uh, phaco emulsification probe. The uh, putting of iris hooks sometimes can cause a permanently atonic uh, pupil postoperatively because it acts like multiple sphincterotomies um, in the iris sphincter. But uh, in this patient, I didn't have any problem and uh, the outcome was really good. So you can see there's some iris um, holes uh, at the port because he had a very small pupil to start with. Thanks. I think I have not exceeded my time. Thank you, Dr. Shubhangi. That was a very nice presentation. Can you take the question, Satyajit? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Dr. Dr. Shubhangi, uh, we are putting this iris hooks. Yes. Is, is, is there any particular uh, uh, pattern in which we should put it at an equal distance or it is more of a customized from time to time? I... And sometimes there is a fear of hurting the capsule also. So what are your tips for this? Uh, actually, I put it on the uh, diagonally opposite uh, and uh, uh, two are uh, besides the main port and two are uh, besides the 
12 and 6 o'clock uh, side ports. Uh, only thing is ki we put some OVD over the anterior capsule before we put the iris hook so that uh, there is some space is created and uh, we do not damage the anterior capsule. And after putting, I don't straight away pull them to the periphery. I just uh, hook them and uh, put the uh, put those pegs. And after putting all the four uh, iris hooks, then we gently uh, stretch the um, hooks yeah. so that we get a pupil size of what we want. And uh, a fifth hook also can be put at the yes. Uh, yeah. main port uh, so that uh, the iris is not traumatized. Yeah, it makes sense. But uh, uh, yeah, the, we can put four and sometimes I even like to put it uh, uh, on the opposite side. If I'm operating temporarily one on the nasal side also, if it's a very small pupil. But do you, any of you feel that the iris hooks is better than BX? We get better expansion than uh, uh, BX? Yeah, um, uh, definitely. Yes, uh, a, oh, sorry. Did you ask me to speak? Yes, so Dr. Silvera. So I find that with iris hooks, you can have a very controlled dilatation. So if you've got like a coloboma, even in cases like a coloboma where part of the iris is missing, I can put an eccentric hooks. If I have an eccentric pupil, I can, I can expand with as many hooks and expand it as much or as little as I want and as centered as I want or as eccentric as I want to get me my working space. Also in UVIT cataracts after breaking membranes and removing pupillary membranes, I find that the sphincters of an atonic in all these as well, I find the use of iris hooks is really, really, in many ways, very superior. It just takes practice. So those not doing it should get used to doing it and it doesn't take more than a couple of minutes. Which of the expert panel is very comfortable with wants, wants malugin ring more often? And when is it you would not use the malugin ring? Um, I was just wondering that if it is a very shallow eye and uh, very difficult to do, would you want to put something bulky as a malugin ring into the AC or those were the cases where you would clearly like to use an iris hook or maybe use a slender thing like a BX ring? I mean, it's just a thought. I want to be contradicted. I just want discussion. Actually, Dr. Chitla, we miss one more point here. I think as Dr. Suvira said, I'm a big fan of iris hooks. Uh, the case she showed with the BX. It was already a large, large pupil. It was not a very small pupil, an ideal one. So yeah. she could put it properly. In a real small pupil, you have a trouble putting BX. Yes. I think uh, that is a point that we should not forget. In a real small pupil, yes. you have a trouble putting BX because it's you have to really drag the thing to really fit onto the pupil margin. I had uh, that problem in the other eye of the same patient. Yes. It was so, iris so, hooks are easy in any kind of that you start, even the one millimeter pupil, you can still put an iris hook comfortably. But yes. uh, I think yes. this applies to any expensive, this applies to any expensive device. I mean, whether it's malignant or VX ring. And whenever it's a very small pupil, you are supposed to uh, stretch it a little bit and then introduce it. So obviously, at least all the people in this panel seem to be more in the favor of uh, iris hooks and as we have pointed out they are versatile in the sense you can just introduce it in the quadrant where you want a, a better exposure and one small point i want to make is that you know you always have to differentiate between a small pupil paper emulsification and a small rexus paper emulsification for example in that case like the first one or even the second one that you showed with a nice staining and it's a, it was not a very hard cataract you can run the rexus under the pupillary margin uh, get a rexis of over we have a small pupil. Yes. I would have actually uh, possibly done this case without any expansive device itself. And uh, obviously, if it has a subluxated lens or a very hard cataract or very difficult floppy iris, then definitely uh, some device would be necessary. And iris hooks is what I favor. But otherwise, second, in to, uh, second patient, sir, the pupil was not dilating beyond four millimeter, three point five four millimeters. So I think iris hook. You don't have to explain your. No, no, I'm not against the idea. I'm just saying that you know, it's, uh, personal comfort. What he was trying to point out that in a moderate pupil, you can do without yeah, a hook is what he was saying. Okay. There has to be a lot more control. You are more relaxed with iris hook. 
So that's okay. But one point you told us was we should put all the hooks and then only stretch it because if you stretch yeah. each, then you will create more sphincter tears. That's a valid point. Going on to the next speaker, Dr. Vishaka uh, Jivankate is the director of Indrakshi Eye Hospital, Mandra, and uh, she is going to show her interesting case. That's why I didn't want uh, Suvera to talk too much of that because that those thoughts are going to come in. So, Dr. Vishaka, Dr. Vishaka, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Share your video. Yes, yes. Good video. Yeah. Ma'am, you can see the video? Yes, we can see the video, but it has to be four minutes, huh? Yes, ma'am. Mm. Slideshow. So just start the slideshow. While Dr. Vishaka is setting up, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite everybody to Patna for the midterm conference yeah. of All India Ophthalmic Society, which is from January 6th, 7th and 8th. So a very warm welcome to everybody to Patna. Yes. Please go ahead, Dr. Vishaka. I'm knowing, I'm knowing Dr. Satyajit and the Patna people, the hospitality is going to be so amazing. We will remember. I think we should all go. We have to really ensure that we come in full numbers for them to be happy with us. We are looking On forward to, you. to welcoming everybody. Uh, good evening, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank AIS for giving me the opportunity to present our work of management of coloboma with a heart cataract. So I'll be presenting a case of a 70-year-old uh, patient having heart cataract. The visual acuity was counting fingers two meters. The challenges which we uh, saw in this case was it was a relatively small cornea. The pupil was semi-dilated. Three, the, there was a zonular weakness. Fourth, it was a heart cataract. And at the same time, we also decided to do the pupillar plasty in the uh, same surgery. Let's see the video. Here, uh, the side port entry has been done. Viscoelastic is injected. Main incision has been done. Now, with the help of a rexis forcep, a uh, circular rexis is uh, completed. Hydro dissection has been done. The nucleus is rotated completely with the help of a dialer so that to free it from all the edges. Now the phaco emulsification has been started and uh, the superficial cortex has been removed. Now here we have done use the wood cutters techniques. Thanks to Dr. Mahatme sir. This is a very easy method because it causes very less uh, trauma or zonular stress and the, uh, the heart cataracts get emulsified and the cracking is very simple. And then uh, one by one, the nucleus is being cut into multiple pieces and all of the uh, pieces are being emulsified slowly, step by step within the back. The whole surgery has been done in the back uh, because the cornea was also decompensated because of his age and uh, all the nuclear material has been removed. In FACO3 settings, the epicortex is removed. And the remnant of cortical matter is removed with the help of irrigation and aspiration cannula. The cortex is removed completely. We have used the polisher to see whether there is any cortical matter present. And hydro implantation of the IOL has been done. So here we can see the IOL is implanted inside the bag. And with the help of the dialer, it is being positioned in the bag. Uh, we took care that while dialing, the haptic part was uh, uh, placed near the side of uh, the zonular weakness so that it acts like a tamponade. Part of the surgery has been over. The second part, the pupillaplasty. This is a small, uh, single pass fourth through pupillaplasty. Tenoproling suture has been passed from one side of the cornea into the iris and from other end, 26 gauge needle is passed into the iris and through railroad technique, the uh, needle has been passed out. A loop is taken out with the help of a forcep. And the most important part, we have to pass the fourth throw from outside in. This is the most uh, crucial part. And uh, once they have been passed, uh, the two ends are being pulled from either side so that the approximation of the edges of the iris occurs. And here we can see 
that uh, there is a nice round pupil. And after uh, suturing this, we have to cut uh, the extra ends with the help of a micro scissor. Now the pupilloplasty, uh, again, we have passed one more suture to complete this. Again, through the same uh, railroad technique. This technique uh, by Dr. Agarwal is really nice. We have done almost uh, four to five cases till now, and it really works very well. And uh, see at the end, uh, we can see that whatever uh, uh, viscoelastic and if any blood present can be removed with the help of Simco. At the end of the surgery, we can see that the cornea is clear, the pupil is round, and uh, uh, the post of very first post of day vision of the patient was six nine parts. So uh, this is a very uh, so to uh, conclude, uh, I would like to tell the woodcutter's technique is an effective way of doing heart cataracts, putting minimal stress on zonules. In the back, phaco emulsification should be gradually done with minimal handling. And uh, single pass, fourth row pupilloplasty, if done in same sitting, makes the pupil round, decreasing the post-op photophobia. And combined surgery is a very convenient for a patient as it gives a very good visual ac acuity the very first post-op day. So thank you so much. Uh, by doing this maneuver, we can definitely give an uh, eager eye view to the patient who's expect uh, and uh, it has a good visual outcome. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Shaka. Before we go Dr. on, Shaka. Case, uh, yeah. could you stop sharing? I would want Dr. Ravi Krishna also to show his video because both are coloboma cases and they can be discussed together. Uh, Dr. Ravi Krishna, are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'll, yeah, I'll can share. You share your video? Yeah. So, good evening, everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Chitra, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity. So, this is a case of uh, iridal lenticular coloboma with RC coloboma with a very hard cataract. So, so, initially, I started with making incisions, the main. 2.8 millimeter and two side ports. And I thought I'll use two iris hooks to have a better exposure in the superior area of the capsule, wherein because of which I can uh, do a very good center drexis. So I'm using cystitome to make a nearly 5.5 millimeter drexis. And uh, I did a hydro dissection. Then I thought I'll put a uh, capsular hook to stabilize the back. Uh, this will reduce the uh, damage to the adjacent uh, zonules, which are next to the area of coloboma. Uh, so I prefer to use uh, a flower petal technique in such cases where the cataract is too hard and I use burst mode with a linear, uh, linear panel. So, and uh, I uh, most of the time I use, uh, I do bevel down FACO and I'm using a 0.5 millimeter uh, uh, blunt dialer, not the chopper. So this is a central part which gets out now. So I'll be emulsifying the same, followed by four quadrant. The advantage of using burst mode in such cases is it reduces the uh, effective echo time. And uh, in between, I come out and put either visco or visco to protect the endothelium as I'm dealing with the harder cataract. So after emulsifying the nucleus, I decided to put a CTR to stabilize the back. Uh, after removal of the cortex. So here I just removed the capsular hook and uh, uh, removal of uh, cortex should be very, very, you should be very, very careful and should be very, very well controlled not to pull the bag in the area of uh, zonal weakness. So finally, I putting the seat here and removal of 
caps uh, iris hooks followed by in the bag implantation of a single piece hydrophobic algo and finally ia yeah. okay thank you yes uh, very good uh, cases both of you all have shown can you stop sharing yes um, um dr parul or dr suvera uh, i want you all to answer this question uh, dr parul uh, would you in a lens coloboma would you think that you should use a ctr uh, because it's an area of zonular weakness uh, would you want to use it ctr for that or would you also believe that there could be a fluid misdirection so you would use a ctr in this particular case or you do use it as late as how dr ravi uh, used in his particular case of very hard cataract i think um, he used ctr only for that uh, for the support to the bag but he was not uh, concerned about the fluid misdirection which can happen in these kinds of eyes with zonular weakness any of you have any thoughts mm -hmm. on that no i would do the same i would wait and watch how the case is going and i would choose to do the ctr later i also keep capsular hooks ready so whatever uh, gives me more comfort at that stage but i would not put it prior i would see how things are going and then yeah yeah madam dr chitra madam dr venkatesh yes yes doctor yeah, regarding the yeah doctor uh, ctr is concerned better hmm. as late as possible or hmm. as early as necessary is best madam Hmm. especially the ctr part like depending upon the status of the zone is that is a zd like if it is less than 2 to 3 uh, hours uh, zd as such like we can just use ctr uh, that that really works out very well like but if it is more than 3 to 5 hours uh, zd as such like then only we have to use for a modified ctr or sioni as such like. sir no 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 normally i agree with you but in a lens coloboma yeah. uh, it is uh, you if we go back now and look up and you can even message me tomorrow placing a ctr is more relevant because fluid misdirection is known to occur in these kind of eyes specifically mm -hmm. that is and the other thing is i quite also agree the that that hook which was placed you know because it's there's some amount of asymmetry in this colobomatous eyes so by placing a hook as suvera had told in the earlier case it allows you to get a nice round rexus So that is another very valid point. Yes, Suvera, you have to be loud. I didn't say anything yet. The others are speaking. So you say in, you tell. In colobomatous eyes with a cataract, most yes. often than not, you find a pupil will not dilate fully. Yes. You know it tends to be eccentrically drawn yes. down. Therefore, yes. the need of hooks to give you the visibility for a yes. nice centered rexus. Yes. yes. Two, it differs from a sublux typical subluxated lens because. this is an area in a limited area where zonules are absent the rest of the yeah. zonules are very very strong so yeah. the need for a ctr is very questionable we do it because it gives us that added support but your point about preventing misdirection or reducing the chances of misdirection is very valid yeah and i think one more thing regarding closing down the iris defect mm -hmm. the patient I is know. lived Okay, yeah. that's not a question. Okay, no, that's a very good question. Yeah, I think so, there is no need to close that iris defect. I completely agree because the patient, the patient is neuro adapted to it. The patient has lived with it all his life. Yeah. Very often yes. the gap is rather big. So what are we yeah. trying to achieve? We are struggling yeah. to close down something which is anatomically made differently, which is not yeah. bothering the patient. So these are my three pearls for colobomas. Yes. Thank you. Chitra, yes, Dr. Yes. Chitra Prasad. Yeah, I think it's a deja vu. I saw Doctor you Now Vishaka's video. I just yeah. made one video for my fellow. We had a case. We did one eye. We did close the coloboma, but okay. during for a shock because the whole pupil had got drawn down. It was not reaching the center of the eye wall. The vision was visual recovery was bad. So we did the other eye. We actually closed it, but we enlarged the pupil slightly superiorly, so that we got the pupil in the right place and the vision. was much better in that and i always agree that probably closing down would be more of a cosmetic satisfaction for us but it may not really make much difference to the visual outcome so at but the same time if you close it please recenter the pupil by actually doing a small sphincterotomy superiorly and bring down the iris pupil because the first that case the pupil will really be small and it will be decentered to the center of the eye wall i think uh, there is excellent uh, uh, i have a question uh, he will be coming one one minute uh, yes dr ramurthy yeah. 
No, both the excellent surgeries they showed, I completely agree. I don't think a congenital coloboma really need to be closed because the patient has lived with it all his life. And uh, uh, also the fact that the capsule is going to opacify there and hardly any light is going to pass through the periphery. And again, even the endocapsular ring placement is quite questionable. At least in these two cases, there was a definite iris coloboma, but I at least could not see any lens coloboma. There's no lens coloboma if the zonules are intact. And both these cases, maybe the excellence of the surgery, I hardly found any phacodonesis or any difficulty in creating the capsular excess. These cases, maybe the even a placement of an endocapsular ring is not necessary. And uh, finally, one question to you, Dr. Ravi, uh, Ravi Krishna. Yes, sir. You know, uh, I saw you're using a wonderful machine, Centurion. Your IOP, you had kept at 85. At one place, you went to 90. 85 is almost something like 110 centimeters bottle height. Sir, actually, uh, I uh, somehow I am used to around 65 to 70, but in this case, uh, uh, I think I had kept at around 85. So I usually keep it on 60 to 70, sir. Okay. Uh, the other question is, uh, uh, which I wanted to ask is, there was one thing you didn't notice that the open end of the CTR was at the site of lens coloboma. It should have got dialed further on. Now, supposing this was a case, Dr. Narayan Shetty, you have raised your hand. If it was a case of a microcornea, uh, what are the other challenges which you'll be facing? A coloboma and a microcornea. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, for me, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. So I, I think, uh, see, uh, sometimes, uh, see, if the fibrosis is not happening, I mean, it's not too good, what happens sometimes people do get the edge effect because of the optic edge before the surgery there's no optic edge at all because the lens was uh, there natural lens but after the surgery you get that optic edge sometimes people do complain of optical disturbance um, there is nothing wrong with uh, uh, suturing the iris you can still do it and but uh, very important is like uh, uh, krishna prasad sir told is uh, you need to slightly uh, center it or enlarge the pupil uh, so that there's more light going in and their night vision improves uh, in such patients. Now, let's say if you don't want to do so much of trauma and uh, so much of inflammation post-surgery because you're handling the iris so much, is just to put a, a what do you call it, colobama ring uh, so that you, uh, you know, you occlude the, uh, the optic junction so further. So, and then you can always, uh, if you want, you can always do a, a iris, uh, I mean, laser post-surgery can do a, a you know, a, what do you call it, laser pupiloplasty. So you can, uh, you know, shift the position of the pupil later on. Yeah, different thoughts. But um, yeah, Dr. Krishna Prasad might have something to say, a microcornea, has it been so hard that you felt you had to do an SICS? Of course, this is a FACO webinar, but it's all right. SICS in a very hard uh, microcornea case. And uh, have you done that? Yes. And uh, in those cases, uh, would you want to make your incision a little bigger because the cornea is small? It's a very valid question. And we do get such cases. Colobomatous microphthalmus is a very known entity. Yeah. The thing is here, SICS would be slightly you know, uh, illogical because the new, the lens size is not very small. It is not a small yeah. lens in a small yeah. cornea. The anterior segment is small, but the lens is fairly big or normal size. So that would create a lot of real estate problem if you want to take the nucleus into the AC and out of the eye. So FACO is the boon in such cases. Only thing is you need to make certain changes as putting even iris hooks. We cannot take a corneal entry for iris hook because that will create that will pull up the iris up as the AC is actually having very little, I mean, the AC depth is very small and the whole. So we have to take the entries, you know, almost at the scleral or the limbal side so that we have, which can actually pull the, retract the iris, not tent it up. At the same yeah. time, you have to probably use a 2.2 instead of 2.8 if you are used to 2.8. So you have to do a microcoaxial phaco and try to work in the lower plane away from the cornea with all the present day viscoelastic support. I think we can still do however hard the cataract is. I think we'll be able to do it and phaco is the way to operate a colobomatous microphthalmus. Okay. Thank you very much. We have covered important things. We go on to our next uh, speaker, Dr. Anuj Kodnani, a young uh, guy. Um, are you doing your fellowship or you have finished it? Uh, about to finish, ma'am. Six months. Okay. So, uh, at KMC Manipal. Uh, no, I, I finished right? the rest from Manipal. 
Yes. Right now I'm at Baduwala Hospital in Baroda. Yeah. Yes. Baroda. Yes. So he is going to show us a very tough case which he has handled. On to you, Dr. Anuj. Uh, so good evening, everyone. I would like to thank uh, Chitra ma'am and AIOS ARC. Uh, so my top pearl um, for cataract surgery will be how to effectively chop a uh, cataract, uh, especially in harder grade of cataracts. I'll just share my video. Is the video visible right now? The screen is there. Yeah. To label a cataract being fakeable, it is vital to be able to chop the nucleus into multiple equal sized fragments. The secret to a complete chop in every attempt is the correct depth and angle of approach. This is where the central well comes in picture. The central well should be beyond the center of the nucleus at around 70 to 80 percent of the depth in order to get a correct angle of impalement. A slight amount of phaco power is applied to bury the exposed tip into the central wall of the well and the Sinsky after being placed close to the tip exerts a force in the opposite direction. This should be performed while the exposed phaco tip is embedded into the walls of the central well reaching to around 70 to 80 percent depth and during the entire chop there is sufficient vacuum being constantly applied, which not only stabilizes the nucleus, but also prevents it from going into the periphery, hence avoids any stress on the zonules. In denser cataracts, the central well needs to have a well-defined depth. It helps in achieving a complete anteroposterior crack. This technique is extremely safe as the rex's margin is never crossed. It has minimal stress on the zonules and the nucleus is cracked within the bag itself. In this chop here, a Sinsky hook is used instead of a sharp chopper. You will notice that both the phaco tip and the Sinsky stay inside the rex's margin and they exert an equal and opposite force leading to a complete crack in the nucleus. The phaco tip should be anchored in the very center during the entire emulsification process and the fragments are nudged towards the tip using the other instrument. If at all the tip needs to go towards the rexes or under it in the peripheral zone, we need to make its bevel up while doing so. To execute all these movements seamlessly, it is essential to maintain centration of the eye in the microscope view with a good red reflex during the entire surgical process. We take advantage of the lamellar orientation of the lens fibers, which allows easy manual separation of the natural fracture planes in a dense nucleus. Staining the anterior capsule helps in deciding the width of the central well and also helps in demarcating our Lakshman Rekha of safety beyond which both the instruments are prohibited to pass through. The phaco energy used to create the well is at a much lower plane and because these multiple equal sized fragments are being nudged in the center, they occupy the superior empty space of the well which keeps them at the anterior capsular plane. This results in immediate post-operative clear corneas even in dense brown cataracts. A safe idea is to move towards the iris plane and switch to epinucleus mode at the time of emulsifying the last nuclear fragment. A point to remember is, more the number of fragments, less will be the power used to emulsify them. We can decide on how many nuclear fragments we want to create in every case depending on the density of the nucleus. Hence, the overall phaco energy consumption in this technique is significantly reduced for the entire emulsification process. The well can be wider in size if required as there is ample peripheral nuclear core remaining for a proper hold during the chop. Another important point in harder cataracts, especially the leathery kinds, is to have a multiplanar approach of the Sinsky where we need to separate the fragments layer by layer going into deeper planes unless we see a complete crack till the base of the nucleus. 
finally developing these solid rules and inculcating these textbook habits in our surgery will exponentially reduce the risk of complications and deliver consistent results to our patients wonderful uh, videos uh, shown uh, anuj and you've learned your art at a uh, very young age um, hats off to you and um, i would want this question or any one of the expert panel something very basic like what should be the choice of eco tip how much would you want to bury it and uh, our next question is would you want to keep the bevel up or down or sideways i want these three basic answers ma'am can i yes yes ma'am so i think uh, i think a beautiful technique and that's uh, all kind of similar to what i also do uh, i think what is important like ma'am said is one is the tip i personally prefer a 45 degree tip uh, it's very important because uh, i mean there's a little bit of compromise on hold uh, but what is very very important is maneuvering is very easy let's say if you want to turn right or left you just have to rotate the faco uh, handpiece instead of you know actually moving if you have a zero tip you have to actually move the whole handpiece right and left to catch the pieces that's one uh, the second thing is uh, uh, in terms of bedding uh, uh, one thing you have to remember is the softer the cataract more deep you need to go and the chops also should be deeper and the harder the cataracts the fico uh, the impaling should be more superficial uh, superficial and chops or the superficial i know all of us have been doing okay harder cataract no no we have to go to the center of the nucleus do the chop the chopper should go really deep actually that is completely wrong please do not do that because you have the hard part of the uh, lens on the top itself so you you if you just uh, impale into that automatically you will have a good hold and just by scratching the lens I mean, with the chopper or the dialer you should be able to get a good crack uh, the other question is i think in terms of uh, direction how you have to uh, face the faco tip while you're chopping mm -hmm. it's a personal preference uh, uh, every, every technique works um, i mean sometimes you can uh, put bevel upwards uh, i think uh, um, someone had shown even bevel downwards they say it's holds better i feel any anything is fine uh just make sure that you do not move your faco tip when you are chopping because that way you don't put stress on the zonules that's the only thing suvera was raising a hand from the beginning yes suvera yeah i'm a direct chop person so one when you're looking at a hard cataract you must have a lot of dispersive ovd to protect your cornea you have to have a faco power which is commensurate and it is the the power which is required to be able to impale and then downsize and then emulsify the nucleus you have to have a big a long chopper with you and you have to have your best tip on the kit with the with the maximally exposed you know sleeve excessive exposed part i must disagree a little bit that when i deal with the harder cataracts i use a burst mode i do a direct chop i start impaling proximally and i go as deep as i can get a good hold in the burst mode which lollipops the nucleus confirm the fixity by moving it up and down and having fixated it now i take a chopper with my no, my non dominant right hand impale into the nucleus just beyond the tip and mechanically divide the fragments that to me is the safest and surest way of dealing with a hard cataract uh, uh yes dr dr anuj, dr anuj you made you made a central well hmm. like you need to rotate the nucleus to make the well properly going di directly vertically down or it's only in one place because to make you have a punched out well you need to actually work all around you need to rotate the nucleus and then make a well, well. that's what the thing that you said yes sir i focus on a very good hydro so i can rotate it like butter and then i keep rotating just a little bit little bit of punches i make and i make sure the base of the well is exactly on the same plane everywhere so yes i do rotate it while making the well otherwise it will not be uh, it will be a diagonal well then otherwise it will not be a, having an equal base all the time is he's doing a flower petal nothing else yeah, something like a flower petal with the yeah, well yeah, yeah. instead yeah, of removing the, the, 
central yeah. core in the uh, in the end you are probably removing it in the beginning so that it's like a flower petal in the reverse direction yeah. i think i think uh, uh, when you are making your chops would you want to complete all the chops and then remove or would you yes. want to chop yes. remove chop remove how would you want to do it so in this technique not you i want the expert panel to tell Dr. I always Kishan. remove once I chop. I remove one piece. I always decompress the bag. I won't keep all the pieces because the rotation becomes much easier. Because all these hard cat rags are very much stuffed into the bag, and most of the bags are weaker. So better decompress the bag as early as you can. Also, the advantage of removing each piece after you've chopped is that you're getting place to maneuver and do the further chopping. Otherwise, it becomes very crowded, and the stress is on the zonules. So yes. once you've got a clear pie and a segment, the idea is to remove it. and you get uh, a better space to move around also okay thank you very much we uh, <coughs> uh, we shall now uh, <coughs> anuj we we go on to the next uh, speaker dr anup chirayat again is the medical director of i vision i hospital trishur and is a faco a refractive surgeon and also uh, does the medical retina work and quite an amazing surgeon and uh, let's see what his video is going to show different learning we move on to beyond fico here yes doctor unmute yourself yeah are you unmuted yeah i am unmuted man hmm so i'll be uh, talking about i'll be showing a series of videos about small problems while in implantation of iol right from small problems like this in this case the the uh, the hydrophobic iol has got stuck into the in the cartridge this may be because the viscoelastic was less but sometimes even if the viscoelastic is there neither does it go inside nor does it come out so it's uh, in such case we really have to struggle and bring it out so this is a small issue before implanting the lens then uh, uh, sometimes when you are using a uh, preloaded in this case it's a preloaded lens so both your hands are engaged in in the and screwing the lens and pushing it in so sometimes your attention comes off your more uh, your attention is more into the on the uh, your injector and uh, sometimes the lens just unfolds outside the board and the problem here is because these uh, this is a like preloaded lens so again putting this lens back into that uh, is may not be possible so in this case i am using a, a cartridge of a sensor lens and implanting the same lens in. so this is another problem which can occur in, with an iul then uh, in, in this case this is also uh, this is again hydrophobic toric lens so uh, i uh, i folded the haptics both the haptics over the optic and then when uh, trying to inject it inside as you can see here the the tip of the cartridge it just breaks it just gives way it splits actually as you can see here before the iol can go inside so this is a soft cartridge tip which sometimes splits because of the pressure so there are certain types of these lenses where actually the folding uh, the haptics should not be folded over the optic but in such uh, lenses the the haptic should be uh, kept uh, both above and below the optic it should not be overlapping over it in this uh, in this manner so, so this again i implanted using a, a different uh, cartridge then i'll just forward it a bit this again the same type of lens it's a hydrophobic lens a very sticky type of lens and here you find both the haptics they just stick to each other and sometimes it takes a lot of time generally uh, they detach after some time but then in a busy ot you cannot uh, wait for it to uh, disengage spontaneously so sometimes you have to manually uh, separate it off but uh, this was, was some particular lenses where they are really very tacky and the haptic really sticks so uh, firmly to the optic that it takes a lot of time and effort to disengage it of course you should not do it uh, in a very uh, vigorous manner because you lest you break the haptic
fine in, uh, in these particular lenses so this is how the lens has to be loaded so normally we fold the haptics over the optic but here it has to be kept both above and below so that they don't stick over each other nor do they overload uh, or uh, nor do they crowd the tip of the uh, cartridge And here in this case, the haptic, uh, the haptic has got stuck. The trailing haptic has got stuck in the wound because it has uh, unfolded inside the wound because of premature uh, removal of the cartridge. So here, one care one has to take is one should not push from outside. Rather, the, the lens should be disengaged from the inside or you may end up causing a Deschmitz detachment. Mm -hmm. Here, the lens has flipped and... Uh, because the, this lens, the memory is less, it is immediately unfolded. So in such cases, I think it is better that you don't flip it back into position and just keep the lens in the same position. Because most of the time, these lenses are, uh, there is no angulation, so it doesn't really matter. Only thing, uh, uh, rotating the lens is a bit difficult, so you just have to fold the haptic and push it in. But at the uh, same time, if you have a, a situation like in this case, where the memory of the lens is good, so it doesn't unfold immediately. Here also it has flipped. I normally implant my lenses under irrigation, so as soon as I disengage, it just flips. That is probably because of the stream of fluid, which is coming from the irrigation port. The lens just gets sort of washed away, so it just flips inside. But since it is not unfolded fully, it is easier to uh, re, uh, reposition it back. So the tip here is that uh, when you are using irrigation while implanting the lens, it is better to stop the irrigation after the uh, while the lens is being injected. Otherwise, this problem can occur. And finally, this is the last video. Uh, so you, you, many of you all may also have experienced this uh, discolored IOLs. Some particular brands of IOLs which discolor after a few months or a, and then you have to remove it. So here, the lens haptics are not got stuck inside the bag. So it was easy for me to just uh, tease it out from the bag without causing any damage to the bag and then uh, put in a, uh, a three-piece lens into the sulcus. But sometimes uh, if these haptics are really fibrous, then you may have to use uh, iris claw lens also or you may have to cut the haptics. So these are certain uh, few things. Uh, problems which we may encounter while implanting lenses. Wonderful, uh, wonderful videos. I'm going to take one, uh, like a rapid fire question with each of the expert panel. Now, uh, Suvir, I'm going to ask you this question. If the IOL is uh, flipping, he says that, uh, he just said that we need not flip it back. What is your thought on that? Oh, you have to flip it back. You'll mess yes. with the eighth sphericity. It needs to be put yes. in this correct position. So turn it around under viscoelastic. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the other thing is that uh, that other case where it was flipping, it was a very deep AC. Uh, do you think, uh, could it have been a high myope in that particular case uh, where, where it uh, flipped? It's just a thought. It's not a question. And uh, Dr. Ramuti, are you there? Dr. Ramuti, are you there? Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Krishna Prasad, the challenges in loading and unloading uh, IUL of a very extreme part, like uh, the, what are your comment on that? Yeah, actually, uh, I have compiled a similar, you know, catastrophes with the high volume. When you have a lens, which is uh, like very high power, maybe plus 30 or something. So we actually uh, sometimes, especially the Indian companies, the lens is much thicker, unlike, you know, some of the multinational brands. So you cannot use the same cartridge, which you would probably use it for a lens of a less adapted part. So I would like to actually say that you can actually cut off the front portion of the cartridge to some extent so that because it as it tapers, you already have a problem in the terminal part of the thing where it has to really squeeze through 2.8. Would rather mm -hmm. cut it off so that it's slightly bigger at yeah. the tip and you can have to enlarge the section maybe to three millimeters and so that you can fit it in. Never ever try a wound assisted insertion because it's very important that we cannot damage the intraocular lens just for saving 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters of the tunnel length. It should not really matter. 
and the one yes. point is here is for the youngsters of pgs who are watching dr anup removed that uh, white eye oil the decal i mean the the uh, uh, the eye oil is actually a hydrophilic lens so yes, hydrophilic lenses never get attached to the capsule this is just an example he could remove it yes. without any problem if it would be hydrophobic it would have been stuck very badly yes and dr parul how do you avoid damage to the eye oil uh, haptics what could be done to avoid it to an extent i think the correct folding making sure that your visco elastic is well coated over the lenses and the positioning of the haptic like a lot of people have a habit where the assistant is giving them um, you know preloaded uh, lenses but i think it, you have to be very careful and put the haptics properly under microscope proper visualization when your lens is coming out it has to be a so slow controlled movement and make sure that the initial part when you in start injecting the iul make sure that you see the movement and how the haptics are in the cartridge because many a time you will have if you start having rigidity and you you start having difficulty in the initial insertion you know that this is a lens which can uh, be a problem so i also, think looking at the movement is important also if the plunger is overriding the haptic that also can uh, mm -hmm. yeah problem. so all this you see before getting the lens inside the eye before the, you see how the lens is moving for the initial 1 or 2 mm under the microscope so you will you'll be very sure of how it's going to come out then yeah dr narain which would be the ideal uh, implantation technique the screw kind or the push type uh i think the screw is the best ma'am i mean no matter what you have complete control in fact i do a screw technique under irrigation itself i implant so what i do is i hold uh, the irrigation in one hand the uh, cannula in one hand the uh, and my assistant rotates the screw so it is very very consistent there's absolutely no complication um i mean i think that's the way forward also there is a, there are, there are some few cartridges where you push but still it goes through a screw so it is a very controlled way the iol is loaded i think that is the future but only thing in a screw type both your hands are involved so i think that is that cannot be done for a hydro implantation right yes but that is what i'm saying hand. so my my assistant rotates the 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 the, the knob and mm -hmm. i hold the the two instruments ma'am and it is extremely oh, okay. controlled okay yeah. is ramurthy back not there okay and uh, finally dr venkatesh you are there could you i am here yeah could you yeah madam yeah madam have anything any final tip for a hydro implantation yeah madam as sir told narin sir told usually in most, in, in our cases usually the assistant will load the i wells or such like that. but we uh, normally do under the irrigation aspect or such like the screw technique is excellent as such like it is very comfortable very smooth and 99% it is easier to implant as such like ma'am ma'am also uh, to in terms of orientation of the lens i feel if it is a biconvex it really doesn't matter uh, which side it is implanted but if it is not you have to uh, rotate it back and uh, i i personally what i do is i do it under irrigation itself but i rotate it after putting into the bag so i put the iol in the bag and then rotate it in the bag itself so it doesn't touch the uh, the endothelium or nothing and absolutely uh, you know it doesn't damage any zonules also because the haptics haven't fold, uh, unfolded fully yet so it's still folded so, so by the time it unfolds you can easily rotate it back so this particular lens it, it had a very less memory so it just immediately unfolded so i yeah, thought it was I risky to flip it back yeah yeah, no, yeah. No, if no, it's no, biconvex no, it's no, fine no, no. it's by wonderful series of videos i just wanted uh, some uh, okay. some one point uh, uh, thoughts on all that we go on to our next presenter dr jay prasad baskaran uh, he is a uh, senior consultant at kochi i care center alua kerala so let's hear from him dr jay prasad <clears throat> let me share my screen mm -hmm. is my screen visible yes good evening uh, and also let me thank dr chitra ramamurthy and uh, many others in this platform who are familiar to me dr anub your uh, video was excellent yeah now let me put uh, take you through a situation which i came across about 12 13 years back 
a man in his 40s with nanophthalmos who went to a refractive surgeon, had an anterior chamber, iris claw, IOL, implanted. His power was around plus 10, plus 12. He came back with severe iridocyclitis and glaucoma. I tried to control medically, but his endothelial cell count was progressively coming down. So I sent him to another refractive surgeon asking for a disenclavation and removal of the IOL. He got it done. Then he came back. The eye became quiet. I put him on contact lenses. And after about eight, nine years, he came back with a cataract, with a small pupil and with multiple synecky. So here I am showing cataract surgery in such an eye. I always do a partial sclerectomy, even though there is a lot of controversy for and against scler partial sclerectomy in an eye with nanophthalmos. But the only points I want to highlight in my video are the iris hook should be inserted with OVD between the iris and the anterior capsule. Sir, we can't see the video as of now. I'm just starting, sir. We all should always remember to do a slow motion FACO continuously maintain anterior chamber throughout the uh, surgery and no post-operative wound leak. So let me start my video.
Thank you. And uh, before, uh, Dr. Chitra, before uh, uh, you go into discuss this, I have two questions to the expert panel. One is, is it advisable to implant an anterior chamber iris claw lens in an eye with an anterior chamber depth of 1.7 millimeter? That is one. And uh, we don't use these lenses these days. Second is, how will we disenclave? Because we use um, iris claw lenses, a lot of them these days to correct aphakia behind the uh, iris. If you have an issue, how will we disenclave, which is the least traumatic way to disenclave an iris claw lens? These two questions I have, let us discuss. Anterior uh, positioning in such a shallow, in any, even if it's a deep AC, anterior uh, enclavation is a complete no-no because uh, very size fakey coyotes have been used and uh, they have not done well and they were taken out. So I think anterior chamber is out. As far as uh, for the iris uh, claw lens, a need to disenclavate, dis um, would you all, anybody want to add on that? I think no, you could... I have uh, some experience uh, with these yes. uh, anterior chamber lenses. We That's the first lenses we start with, uh, fakey coyotes. Obviously, because of progressive loss of endothelial cell count, um, we gave that up and switched on to these uh, posterior chamber lenses. But even at the time when we were using it, it was at least three millimeter was the anterior chamber depth that we we're looking at, and less than that, it's not a good idea. As regards your question about disenclavation, we have disenclavated a few of these iris clip lenses which are placed anteriorly. In these cases, all we have to do is to make a usually it's a five or a six millimeter optic. You make a spiral tunnel of that lens and then uh, hold the optics of the lens with the lens holding forceps, go in with a uh, Sinsky hook or with an iris spatula and lifting up the lens, just press on that area of enclavation. And on either side, you do it, then rotate it in the vertically oriented and bring it out. And now when we do a iris clip lens on the posterior aspect of the iris and, uh, you know, uh, Generally, these cases do well. And there have been an occasional case where one of the haptics has come off because of an inadequate uh, the enclavation and it's hanging in the vitreous cavity. I think just in one case, we had to re-enclavate that. But otherwise, I have not had an uh, occasion where I had to disenclavate a posteriorly enclavated uh, 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 implant. But I would consider that if you do the same thing, hold the lens and then pull on the iris uh, at the... Uh, in the axis of the enclavation, the enclavation should get released. Maybe lift up the iris in that case. You may have okay. to lift up the iris and you, if it's a retrofixated, you can need to go with the spatula and lift up the iris and hold the optic down and that would uh, let go, no? Because you were talking for the anterior. Yeah. The posterior, I think that would be the way. Now, when would you think, I'm going to ask you this question, when would you think of putting the ma IUL, maximum IUL power in the bag or some in the IUL bag and some as piggy bag? When would you consider? Because I think putting the high full power in the bag, there's a lot of spherical abrasions which are introduced in these very high powered lenses. So does it make sense to put amount, significant amount of power of the IUL in the bag and then go back uh, post-operatively, re-evaluate what is the residual error to tell your uh, uh, patient and then go back and use the Nichamin's uh, nomogram and uh, insert a piggyback lens later. You also need to increase your incision if it's a customized IOL because it's a larger IOLs. I mean, this is a discussion point which uh, I want you all to comment on. I think a piggyback lenses for nanophthalmos mm -hmm. is not again a good idea because again, there's a space problem. It's not a normal uh, I mean, eye where you can actually yeah. have a space between the you know, the actual pseudofacia as well as the iris tissue. I think yeah. it would be better to customize the lens and put one eye wall rather than two eye walls. Oh, I would beg to differ on that, Krishna Prasad, because, you know, as you yourself said, these nanophthalmic eyes, though the eye is small, the lens is reasonably big. And most often these lenses are 3.5 to 4 millimeters, the natural lens in the anterior posterior diameter. And we take that out, even your 40 day after lens measures only about uh, 1.5, 1.3 millimeters in the anterior posterior diameter. So there's enough space for putting in two of these lenses in the, even in these anophthalmic eyes. And I have done this and up to 56 day of test. It's not just the spherical aberration. The bigger challenge in these cases is getting the right IOL power calculation. 
you know if you use even four different modern formula generally i swear by the barrett universal 2 uh, offer q and others i mean the srkt each one often gives a different uh, uh, oil power and you are not sure which one to implant so in these situations what i do is to go ahead and place a plus 40 doctor lens and then you have a residual error even you have uh, even the toricity is, is there in the piggyback lenses the simple formula is that uh, Whatever be the reason for the residual error, if it's plus six diopters, you just have to multiply it by 1.5 and place a nine diopters inside. We've done in this in a few cases, and you'd find that these uh, non-ophthalmic eyes also, there is enough space for putting in two lenses because the primary lens that you have removed has been occupying so much space in the eye. And uh, yes, of course, you would go ahead and do a peripheral hydrotomy in these cases as an extra precaution. But uh, I find that uh, the, that's the way to deal with it, uh, these situations. No, that's a contingency plan for the refractive surprise or the residual error, which is not no, connected. No. What I'm saying is, for example, I noticed the, what uh, the power... So is it a Jaya primary Prasad plan to put two lenses or it's a contingency plan? No, Dr. Jay Prasad put in plus 38 doctors. Up to plus 40 doctors because we have good aspheric single piece lenses already available with us. I go ahead and implant this. But in case there are cases where we require 50, 52, 54, like that, where we are not even sure of the oil power, then we, as I mentioned, the primary lens power that goes in is plus 40 diopters, and the balance power we put in as a piggyback. In this case, yes, this primary lens itself is 38 has taken care. Usually in real nanophthalmic eyes, uh, you find that, uh, you know, the power required is even more. What was the axial length in your case, Dr. Uh, 16.5 or so, 16.5 or so, and the power was not very high because the cornea was steeper actually. The, these eyes, many of them do have steeper corneas. This eye was almost 50, near 50 diopters. Right. I think uh, answering Parul's question, I would look at Barrett's. I'm not, I think Canes, I look at for keratoconus, but now even Barrett has for Canes. Uh, but I wouldn't look at Hoffer Q and SRKT because the fourth generation formula is what we have to look at for extremes of axial length. While Dr. Harshwardhan connects his video, one last question. Anybody would like to comment on when they want to use phylactic sclerostomy? I think unless it's a thickened sclera with nano I don't see a need to use it. Anybody wants to comment on that? I think since nobody is talking, I mean, this is a carry forward from the days when uh, extra capsular cataract extraction was being done, and this was fairly routinely done. You're supposed to do this about uh, uh, at least a week before your primary surgery, and then go ahead and uh, do this, uh, uh, do this colostomy and leave it open. But nowadays, with the more controlled surgery with the phaco emulsification, maybe this is uh, not really necessary. One arbitrary number has been talked about where they, with a uh, measure the sclerocorneal thickness as clear as. Uh, UVO scleral thickness, if it is beyond 1700 microns, you do a sclerostomy, otherwise you don't do it. But I think that again is a subject to question. I, as of now, we don't do this. We just go ahead and we are aware that UVL effusion is a possibility. They don't allow too much uh, fluctuation in the intraocular pressure, but we get away with that. We don't really do this uh, posterior sclerostomy nowadays. Yes, we now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Harsh Vardhan Gupta, who is the Chairman and Chief Consultant at Om Netar Kendra and Laser Vision Center from Raipur. He is a, again a cataract, pediatric and a refractive surgeon and oculoplasty too. So multiple uh, combinations. So on to your interesting video, Dr. Harsh Vardhan. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I'll start my first video. I'm just showing a few uh, edited videos. Your I'm volume should to... go up on your yeah. laptop. You're very feeble. Uh, is it, am I audible now? Yes, yes. All right. We are just uh, showing a few edited videos, about one minute each, about three to four videos of uh, white cataracts, where despite all precautions and whatever we are supposed to do, we have done, and but uh, we have Rex's extension or what we call the Argentine flag sign and how we manage it so that uh, we don't have to abandon the FACO surgery and we complete it. So the, putting the, starting the first video. This is a white cataract and we're just starting the rexis part. We'd best stick to the rexis thing. 
and uh, we're just starting and uh, the milky fluid is now coming out as you can see and trying to aspirate some of the milky fluid to uh, decompress the bag the capsule has been stained uh, before taking up the rexes but here because uh, i'm unable to uh, continue with the rexes i'm uh, attempting again and again but still it appears that the rex is getting extended now at the 12 o'clock position and uh, the rex is uh, there's a risk of the rex is getting ragged and getting more so we are starting the main uh, made the main incision and after refilling the chamber using the rex's forceps to complete the rex's and not attempting to continue the rex's with the cystitome which could have led to even greater extension and embedding of surgery. Now the rex is complete. It's a slightly eccentric rex is, but uh, it's uh, intact rex is, and uh, we're just doing the FACO and uh, that's uh, just done, taken care of. And the FACO is complete without embedding the FACO. This is the next case. Similar white cataract, we're starting the rex is, a small puncture, uh, well filled anterior chamber. It's going well, it's still going well. And uh, suddenly I see that now it is getting extended. Now the rex is getting extended. So rather than keeping on attempting to do that, now I move to the main port and try to do it with the rex's forceps. And we can manage to complete the rex's. The rex is get stuck and we're using the vanas for uh, scissors so that I'm able to complete and have an intact rexis. And we can proceed with the FACO safely and uh, complete the FACO. I'm just putting in the lens, the, the, putting the lens inside the eye. And the rex is, is not uh, very pretty, but uh, it works and we can safely complete the FACO and put the IUL in the bag. One more very elderly patient with uh, white cataract and uh, uh, grade three to four nuclear sclerosis. So it's a hard white cataract, which is one of the generally the, uh, the tougher ones. Here again, we're attempting to do the rexes. It's, you can see it's a well-stained capsule and uh, still unable to move it forward. And it appears that if I continue to do this, I might land up in a full-fledged Argentinian flag sign. So here I'm abandoning the uh, putting a viscoelastic and then through the main port Again, shifting to the uh, rexis forceps. In the last two cases, I hadn't had to use the vanas, but if need be, we can use the vanas to create a more. And we are able to salvage the rexis and uh, obviously take care of the cataract. And this is the at the end of the surgery. In the last case, again, a white cataract. These cases are very few and far in between, but they do happen sometimes. And nowadays uh, we see that we have got actually less and less of white cataracts and we are getting softer and softer cataracts. Patients are coming earlier to us. I'm not un unable to uh, do the rexes and trying to do it the other way around if I can, but still it, I was unable to do it. So again, made the main port. And gently we are just trying to complete the rexes as best as we can. And we've managed, and this is the end of that surgery. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Harshwadhan, for showing a variety of cases. Uh, if you stop sharing.
Uh, Dr. Suvira, would you want to tell me how we should do a Brian's little technique to get back a Rexis which is running away? So in order to do the little technique, you do it at a point when it's not completely gone up to the zonules. Because mm -hmm. once something has gone up to the zonules, it's virtually impossible to get it back. And you could, if you disrupt some zonules and you have to pull firmly. Little's technique is used when you are when it starts to run off to the periphery. You stop exactly where you are, come out of the eye without further decompressing the eye, put viscoelastic deep in the anterior chamber, and then we go with a pair of an intraocular forceps held from the other side, hold on to the edge of the the edge of the tear at the point where it meets the rest of the rexes and pull towards the center. When you pull towards the center, the, the tear instead of proceeding in an outward shear motion now rips and comes, finds its way towards the center. Once it gets back on track, you proceed in the normal way. So basically you have to unfold the flap and pull it uh, away yeah. from the direction of the tear, pull it towards the center so that not along the direction of the tear, and then you cut it. The other important uh, question which I wanted to ask was, um, I'm going to ask Ramuti, how would you do, Dr. Ramuti and Krishna Prasad to answer, how would you uh, handle an intermissive cataract? Do you want to make a small round rixis, or would you want to make a linear curved rixis? How would you all want to deal with this? Or commonly do, or you do different techniques for different intermissive cataracts? So you can start. Dr. Ramuti or Krishna Prasad or even Nanin Chetty. Sir. Yes, Dr. Krishna Prasad. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think I have tried. There are many techniques, many ways to skin the cat. I think every conference is replete with the techniques. Every time there's a new name. But I have found that probably the simplest thing is used a good uh, premium viscoelastic. And uh, no, normally we stay in the capsule, put a premium viscoelastic, and I may use the side port. Okay, I always use the no, uh, the cystotome, but to start off, but I always complete with the capsular excess forceps. I think the use of uh, I use viscoat most often, and I have not really found another technique. I'm, I mean, probably which is better than this. You may probably do any technique. Every every technique works. You know your. Uh, double rexes, you know, uh, spiral rexes and puncho rexes, you name anything. I think a good quality viscoelastic should do the job. Yeah, yeah. but off late I started doing a small rexes and then uh, enlarging it and more consistent that way. But I saw a wonderful video of the, uh, one of the doctors showing a, a, a C shape, uh, just making okay. that that is a semicircular I think instead of making just a horizontal nick, going a curving it itself will prevent the rexes from extending. Ramurti, you have anything to add? I think what you're saying is absolutely intuitive because uh, if you make a horizontal slit, that's the one which can extend onto the poles. Obviously, if it's curved, there's mm -hmm. no way it can extend to the um, to the furnaces. Then that's the reason your initial nick should itself be that way. As Mr. Prasad said, there are various things that have been described, but the basic principle of all of this is that the intralenticular pressure should be less than the intraocular pressure. I mean, the pressure in the intracameral pressure. So as far as you're able to achieve that and have a flat anterior capsule, the tendency to run off is less. I think uh, Suvira very nicely described the brand little uh, maneuver. And that's a beautiful rescue technique whenever it's almost about to run off. And one very important factor that you need to remember is that uh, when you're doing this, you have to lay the rexes back onto the lens surface. Yeah. Unfold I mean, it, yes. Usually, the intuitive thing is to go ahead and hold it and then pull on along the direction which, which you are proceeding with the rexes yeah. and maybe put uh, give some traction internally towards the center of the globe. But instead of that, what is classically described is to lay the rexes back onto the uh, lens surface, hold exactly where it is tending to run off, as she said, and pull it in the direction in which the rexes came and inwards. And that seems to get the uh, rexes back on track. And I've tried it a couple of times and it really works. I mean, it's uh, slightly counterintuitive, but it works. Ma'am. Uh, Thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Darin. 
Yeah, I think in terms of technique, I think uh, whichever technique works in the surgeon's hand, they should just follow it. It should be consistent mm-hmm. and it shouldn't have any complication. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, simple ways also, you can, if it is an intermissive, you know that if you have OCT, it's good to uh, use it. Mm-hmm. You can actually grade the kinds and you'd know which which cases you can have an Argentine mm-hmm. back sign. And, if you, uh, and one more small tip is on the day of surgery, you can always do a small YAG in the center of the lens. So that some amount of uh, intralentricular fluid comes out from the bag. So by the time they go to the OT, the, the intralentricular pressure would have reduced. This doesn't prevent the running away of the rexus, but it prevents the Argentina flag sign. The other tip is also whenever we use, uh, uh, the, let's say, a sister term, right? It's a normal needle. It's got an uh, angulated tip, basically. If you have a, a, a needle which is like like a like how a normal sewing needle, right? It has it is a complete just a pinpoint uh, uh, the tip. So if you use that to make a nick in the center, that won't lead to a slit and which it'll go away. So that is also one few tips which uh, I would like to say for the juniors and the PGs yes. who are uh, watching the webinar. While Dr. Rohita gets connected, Parul, you had raised your hand. You want to say something? Yeah, just two very basic points which we are noting and uh, good videos. But when you're handling any rexes which is trying to go out, here the handling was done through the main port. Now that can be very risky because the forcep indents the posterior lip of the tunnel, shallows the anterior chamber and you lose the control of your anterior capsule. Mm-hmm. So whenever you're maneuvering your rexes, preferably go through side port, not through the main port and use the micro vitral forcep. Yes, 100%. I agree. One more question. At least IV mannitol prior to surgery, that really helps a lot. Like mm. IV Can- mannitol 20%. For intermissal cataract, I mean, it's such a um, strong medicine to give. Uh, I think uh, oral yeah, risk all the condition of seeing all the condition of like do because many of our patients are cardiac patients. We have to have a proper standby anesthetist if you're going to use uh, IV mannitol in small practices. So I don't want that message to go across. Um, I think uh, Dr. Rohit. Dr. Rohita Naik is our next speaker and she's a senior consultant in cataract from Narayan Netralia, Bangalore and she's going to show us her interesting case. On to you, Dr. Rohita. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Chitra, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity and the panelists for the lovely discussions which we are having. Today, I'm presenting a case of secondary IOL. Uh, this is following a uh, post keratoplasty. The this is twenty nine year old uh, male for keratoconus. The first PKP was done in uh, two thousand nineteen elsewhere, and in uh, two thousand twenty one he was referred to our cornea department for regraft. The regraft was done uh, uh, along with the cataract surgery, and eight months after the second graft he was referred to me for secondary IOL. The challenges in this case was the uh, large macular grade opacity nasally, extensive posterior sinicae, which is present, and also a posterior plaque, which you can see just behind the uh, macular opacity. Uh, We've lost you, (laughs) Dr. Rohita. Could you switch off your video and talk? We can't hear you. Pardon me, ma'am. You can, you can switch off your video and talk. Your network is bad. Or mine is, I don't know. She's heard well. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll continue? Yeah, yeah, continue. Yeah, I do my uh, 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 side ports more peripherally, more limbally. I'll, same with my main port. I do move peripherally. It's quite a large graph. The first challenge is to separate the uh, posterior sinicae to find a plane to place the lens. Temporarily, I am unable to find the plane. So I go through the surgical PI and try to find a plane. Uh, need to be very gentle during this process because we may cause an hydrogenic uh, iridodialysis during uh, this part. Once I feel uh, that the pupil is good enough, I go on to the second challenge, which is the plaque. I make a small nick with the cystotome, use the micro scissors to make a nick to cut 
at least around uh, 3 to 3.5 millimeter of uh, a posterior rexis, we can see that the posterior pigment epithelium is plastered onto the capsule. There is no distinction between anterior capsule, posterior capsule, but just a small 3.5 mm posterior rexis I've done. And uh, I was thinking if I place the lens, I'm done. I'm trying to place the lens, but uh, when I'm placing the lens, there is resistance. I'm not able to find a plane to put the lens into the sulcus. Initially, there was no uh, uh, vitreous disturbance, but I can see the vitreous disturbance. I just enlarged my incision after this. I am enlarging the incision. I'm trying to manipulate the lens using two instruments, but the vitreous disturbance is too much. So I think of explanting the lens to do a vitrectomy. I have not used Trifan Blue in this case because it's a regraft patient. Uh, so Tramsil alone because it's a regraft patient. Now I, it dawns on me to put the hooks so that uh, I see why I was not able to place the uh, lens into the sulcus. Peripherally, it is clear. There is some more vitreous for which I do more vitrectomy. So after I ex extended the incision, I placed the three piece. Rotate it into the sulcus. Once I've taken out the hooks, center it. Few strands of vitreous are there. I use my scissors to cut it. I close my main port using a cross suture. Form the AAC. And this is his uh, one month post-op. He is uh, 612, best corrected with the minus two cylinder at uh, 90 degrees. I'd like the panelists to give their opinion. Thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, uh, split uh, video which you showed um, about uh, many of the steps of your surgery. But uh, one important thing is I wanted to ask is when would you plan the combined versus a sequential cataract surgery? Because you are a cornea person. I just thought maybe you could answer this question yourself. I'm not a cornea person, ma'am. You're not a cornea person. <laughs> no. Huh. But you're showing, a, uh, anyway, you're showing a cataract surgery. Yeah, that. it was referred to me for secondary IOL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anybody would want to answer this? When would one want to do a combined uh, surgery, cataract surgery with a PK? Or I think majority of the time you do that, but would there be any time when you would not want to do it? Anybody to comment on that? No, see, obviously, if you have a Fuchs dystrophy with a, a significant, visually significant cataract. Yeah. So if you're already planning for a, a, a DSEC or a DMEC or whatever, PDEC, so obviously you can uh, uh, I mean, yeah. go ahead and do the cataract surgery because in any case, doing a cataract surgery uh, with even a fairly, you know, uh, you know, uh, so what you call as the early, I mean, coronal decomposition is possible actually in good hands. So probably you can go ahead, do the complete the cataract surgery and then probably plan for a, a, a endothelial keratoplasty later. That would be better in terms of uh, the thing. But anyway, there'll be always after, even after dissect, there'll be very little biometry changes. So they'd not be really a, a I mean, matter of consequence. But in this case, why was the IO not put in the primary surgery? They had removed a cataract. That would have been the best time to put an IO in, right? Why was it not put? I have no idea why was it not put, sir? <laughs> because it was I a regraft. Uh, actually, was, uh, the first uh, uh, graft was done. This was in, a, uh, yeah, this was a referred case, I think, which was sent to the hospital. So yes, they, sir. Uh, okay, okay. Some pa yeah, yeah, some patients, uh, some, was... some doctors are uh, they prefer just to do the PKA, or sometimes they don't have the cataract surgeon in their setup. I mean, I, I'm not very sure about the reason, but they yes. came post PK. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, this was the, the FAQ. Oh, yeah, they FAQ to the hospital. Mm -hmm. That's 
why I think she planned the same session. So where is the location of the incisions when you make on a such a large graft? It becomes nearly scleral. More, more limbal and more scleral, ma'am. Mm, yeah. And the other question is, in these uh, any case when there is a while we are talking on iris soups, uh, any case when there's a PCR, in those cases does it make sense to use a iris hook uh, or uh, uh, a ring? I'm not comfortable with the ring, ma'am. Yeah. I think I prefer uh, iris hooks. Yeah. Yes. If, if go on, by chance, go on uh, ma'am, yes. yeah, please go ahead. No. no, no, you were saying something? No, no, I, I think I was just saying, ma'am, that uh, uh, if uh, by chance, if there's a zonular dialysis and then uh, at that point you're planning to do a capsular instead of an iris hook, you can actually use a capsular hook that it'll give that itself will help you to hold the bag and the iris, uh, and that'll uh, you know play as a two role yeah. uh, with one shot, like hitting two birds in one stone. Yeah. We go on to our next speaker, Dr. Amod Amod Kitur, who's again a, a, a young uh, so a student who is uh, studying a junior consultant from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and he's going to show us a very interesting case too. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. I am there. Mode, yes. I'll just share my screen, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Chitra, ma'am, and, and the whole AIOS for giving me this opportunity. I am the senior resident working at RP Center Ames under Professor Namrata Sharma, ma'am. So I'll just share my screen to start my video. This is my learning uh, as I entered the first year of senior residency. This was the case given to me. This was a traumatic subluxated cataract of a 48 year old. Uh, male patient. So I will just start my video. So I'll start with my side ports in this and I'll just inject intracameral adrenaline to dilate. And here we can see around three to four clock hour of subluxation uh, in a soft cataract relatively around nuclear sclerosis grade one to two. Then I'll go ahead and inject diluted tricot to see if there is any prolapsed anterior vitreous. Then if I, then when I wash the tricot, then I realize that there is some amount of prolapsed and uh, vitreous in the site of subluxation. So first, before starting anything, I will go ahead with my vitrector and I will do limited anterior vitrectomy in the site of uh, the uh, vitreous prolapse before moving ahead with cataract surgery. Then once I complete the limited anterior vitrectomy, then I'll inject the viscoelastic and I'll move ahead with my main port to start my capsulorexis. Then I complete my capsulorexis with uterata forceps. And then now I'm planning to put the capsular hooks here to before starting my phaco emulsification. Now I will change my illumination to retro illumination and I will make three sides. ports to engage my capsular hooks. Now, once the three side ports are made, then I realize that my capsular excess margin is not quite visible. So now I'll go ahead and stain the capsule. This is called capsular painting. So which is done under HPMC. So I did it capsular painting. Now I can clearly delineate my excess margin to put my hooks in. So I'll put my all three nylon hooks, which are also called as capsular hooks, which have got silicon block. Then I'll do a limited hydro dissection and a good hydro delineation. And this is a relatively softer cataract. So it was not that difficult to complete my FACO. The parameters were kept quite low. If you can see the IOP is 30. So the parameters were kept quite low and simple chip and flip technique take out the endoneus and emulsify the rest of the material. So it was relatively easy. Then I'll go in with coaxial IA probe and take out the cortex and leave the cortex, which is there under the capsular hooks intact. I'm not touching that cortex till last. And then I'll go in with my bimanual cannula and then gradually and with control, I'll just take out the uh, cortex and then I'll take out my capsular hooks. And then I'll inject the, CT, uh, the CTR, I'll insert the CTR. Once the CTR is placed, then I can make out the bag is fairly stable to inject my planned three-piece IOL. So I'll go in to inject my planned three-piece IOL inside the bag. So once the 
IOL is inside the bag. So I'll just tuck my haptics in. So it is fairly centered. So I was quite happy that the IOL was fairly centered and stable. I'll go in and take out some of the vitreous, which was again prolapsing through the same area. And also I'll take out the viscoelastic, which was there in the anterior chamber. And then I would like to close my wounds with hydration. So this was my case. This was my initial learnings in, uh, in cases of subluxated cataracts. Uh, I am open for discussion. So I'll be really happy for the comments. Wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, uh, video. And I think your learning is nearly complete at a very young age. I'm very impressed with you. Yeah, using capsule, capsule hooks and then going on and then placing a CTR is definitely one way of keeping the capsular bag uh, stable. But there may be uh, uh, some surgeons, more surgeons who are doing past plana would say that uh, in a very small area of zonular weakness, by instead of going anteriorly, you might lose more vitreous and prob uh, it's better to, and the area of dialysis could increase. So to go posteriorly and do a past plana approach would be a more contained way of uh, doing things. But if you are doing in an anterior approach, uh, Dr. Narendra Shetty, I'll ask you, what should your parameters be for vitrectomy? It's a very small area of zonular weakness. And the zonular, so what should be your cutting cut rate and what should be your um, flow rate vacuum? Yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. I think the, the the cut rate should be the maximum what the what your machine has. And mm -hmm. if you have a little lower, it's it's simple as this. If your cut rate is not that high because of your machine, that means your vacuum should be lower. If your yeah. cut rate is very high or good enough, mm -hmm. then vacuum little higher is fine. And uh, more I like uh, uh, even, the values. I, I would say about 200, 250. Uh, I think that much is more than enough to e easily eat up all the vitreous. And uh, more importantly is to stain and do it so you know where you are. Uh, because uh, it is uh, it is very easy that you keep doing, no, no, I can see the vitreous, I keep doing, but it's good to stain it, especially when it's coming from the sulcus. You see, from a PC, uh, PCR, I mean, it is okay. I mean, you can, uh, from the PCO, you can easily make out what is happening, what, I mean, where it is, but from the sulcus, you can easily miss. Mm. Yes, yes. That so itself can be actually pushing the bag to one side. So it's extremely mm. important to uh, stain and then take the cutter as close to po as possible and remove. Is Ramuti there? Yeah, I think apart from what Narendra already mentioned, one other thing you can keep in mind, especially with the recent machines, is that you use the cut IA mode in the sense that when you are using, uh, moving it, uh, it cuts first and then aspirates. So that's what is to be done. And as you mentioned, in these cases, it's always a good idea to do a pasplena vitrectomy because that uh, sort of draws the vitreous out. You can you stain from the anterior ch chamber. Then uh, from the past plana, when you do the vitrectomy, you can literally see the vitreous being drawn backward. And in this particular case, which was beautifully done, you could mm. still see a knuckle of vitreous almost right through. And even though he attempted to remove it towards the end, I think that there was something there because there was a, some stain of a tricot that's left over there. Other thing is he rightly used a three-piece lens. And nowadays to stabilize these bags, the concept is to go ahead and uh, these three-piece haptics are uh, kept in the sulcus and you create a good optic capture that is supposed to stabilize these uh, um, <coughs> bags very well. And I think uh, he did the right thing by using endocapsular ring and not a Sioni's ring in spite of the fact that it is a fairly large uh, dialysis, about three to four clock hours, because this is a post-traumatic uh, subluxation. These are not progressive. So once you it's stable on the table, is likely to remain so for the patient. Yes, yes, all very rightly said. Uh, very uh, wonderful video shown. Uh, uh, I think one comment as a glaucoma surgeon is, uh, yes. I mean, you should tell all the postgraduate to use a diluted uh, triumphant right. lock because if right. you inject, it may go in and it will become a vitreous implant and you may have a lot of intractable glaucoma in especially susceptible. I think one is to 10 dilution is the most ideal. Yeah, because you just need few particulate matter to just stain the vitreous right. strand. And yeah. maybe I'm not for a very high vacuum because you may damage, I mean, you may yeah. probably catch the, uh, especially the iris. So I'll yeah. be slightly lower on the vacuum, of course, on the highest cut rate. Yes, right. Uh, we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Prachi Gower, who's a director at Prabhat Eye Care. 
and uh, is a FACO refractive and glaucoma consultant. And we'll look, let's look at her presentation. Dr. Prachi. Okay. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, I, after watching so many challenging cases, but I'll be showing you a normal routine FACO where I land up into a PCR and um, and let's see how I'll manage this case and this video is from my fellowship days. You don't want to talk? You can be talking while it's showing. Pardon? You want to talk along with the video? Uh, is my voiceover coming? Can you hear no. it? No. Okay, okay. Is it audible now? No. Today I am presenting a video. You're not hearing your voice. It's something very feeble. Okay. Uh, doctor, can you uh, share the sound? There are three buttons on top right hand side. Just click on it. Share computer sound. The audio is not coming from the video. Or you can just stop share and then reshare. When you when you click share screen, there is bottom left, there is something called share sound. Just click on the share sound. Yes, yes, yes. Now the audio will be coming. Today, I am presenting a PCR case which happened in a routine FACO emulsification surgery. So, let's see how I manage this case. So, after making two initial side ports and main ports, continuous curvilinear rexus was made using capsular rexus forceps. Gentle hydro dissection was done with minimum fluid ensure free mobile nucleus and to start with FACO emulsification I prefer stop and chop technique after aspiration of anterior cortex and epinucleus within the rexus margin to expose the anterior nucleus I sculpt the nucleus to make a long and a deep trench with a bevel up FACO tip Crack the nucleus into two halves manually using a Sinsky hook in left hand and FACO probe in right hand. Ensure complete separation and attainment of two equal heminucleus. Each heminucleus is then chopped sequentially to make fragments. Chopping is performed using a sharp tip chopper placed within central capsular rexus and moved centrally and vertically. Fragments are then taken out of the bag, emulsified and aspirated at anterior capsular plane. So here, while removing the nucleus fragment, I noticed a posterior capsular rent. So viscoelastic was injected using secondhand instrument before taking out the FACO probe. And here, the case was converted to SICS and corneal scleral tunnel was made. Meaning nuclear fragments were removed using visco expression. Bimanual anterior vitrectomy was done using cutter. 
an irrigation and aspiration of cortical matter was done using cut IA. Three piece PMMA IOL was placed in the sulcus and the elastic was removed. Eye was closed after wound hydration. Thank you. Thank you. That was a nice uh, teaching video. Uh, Dr. Suvira, I would uh, like to ask a question from you. What would be your uh, end point of vitrectomy? When you decide that the vitrectomy is done? Of course, tricot is one deciding factor, but otherwise? You're uh, muted, I think. So I think the other thing is when you actually see the pupil going down, if there is prolapsed vitreous, vitreous typically, typically comes... Uh, tends to prolapse towards the pl place of least resistance, which is the incisions. And that causes a peaking of the pupil. So in case you've not used tricot and you can't actually see a blob anymore, you look for a circular pupil, you look for an absence of a bulge, you look for deepening of the anterior chamber. These these would be my you guidelines. You can see those minimum DM folds, which tells you that uh, you have done enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, for, sorry, yeah. So that too. <clears throat> yeah. There was one I point, guess. there was a PC rent and already probably the vitreous was uh, into the bag. So mm -hmm. one point that should be clarified is when you're actually doing a vis visco expression of the uh, nucleus fragments, mm -hmm. the vitreous already come into the anterior chamber. Probably mm -hmm. we need to do a basically a vitrectomy, clear those strands and then probably use a high, a good quality viscoelastic like viscote or helon GV to actually buttress it or to create a platform and then actually take the pieces out. Because if we can probably in that hurry take the nuclear pieces out, we can cause a lot of vitreous traction, which may be dangerous on a later date. The other thing is, what about temporal against superior SICS in this particular case? Does it matter at all? If you've had a PCR and, and another thing I felt was she need not have made those side cuts, you know, because it was only one half of the nucleus which was there that could have been avoided. But I wanted maybe an SICS surgeon would tell whether at this point it should be. No, we are all SICS surgeons also. Yeah. I think there is no distinction. So what is difference between temporal and superior? If there is, there point. is. Obviously, we want a superior section. See, yes. temporal incision is only for the sake of, if you are doing a primary in SICS, you may have probably an option. But in case if you want to convert, I would always yes. do superior. Superior, exactly. I wanted that answer. Ramuti, are you there? He's not, so not letting him so go. Anybody, um, now Dr. Narain, can you tell me what are the pearls in doing optic capture? Like something simple. Uh, I, I think what is very important is in, uh, let's say, if you know that there's a high risk of PCR, uh, you know, uh, uh, PCR in uh, in particular case, make sure you, your excess is not too large. Because if you have a very large excess, sometimes optic capture becomes mm -hmm. difficult. Uh, and uh, and also, uh, I again, I usually do it under irrigation itself. I I mean, I place it, and then uh, what you can do is, uh, this is one very important step. Is let's say you, once you put the three piece IOL in the sulcus, you have to take the cutter below the IOL and then finish off. Uh, you know, some amount of viscoelastic which has gone behind, or some amount of vitreous. Please, please remove all of that, mm -hmm. and then anteriorly you can clean that is very important because that's your last chance before you act, uh, actually do the capture it's your last chance to the uh, uh, your, you know posterior part of the lens so finish that and then come uh, come on top do the optic capture and then clear out the viscoelastics and everything else uh, anteriorly because once if you don't do the optic capture again when you're trying to clear out some amount of visco and other things can move around uh, uh, between the two segments so it's important to do the optic capture and then clear out the anterior uh, and and push the part of the optic which is perpendicular uh, to the haptic. Absolutely. Per push the per per perpendicular to the haptic. Now, if there are two, sometimes what happens, some partial part of the posterior capsule is also there and you have anterior capsule. If you push too hard, it, it, it tucks in your posterior capsule also comes on top of the IOL. So it should just be enough so that uh, it just enough so that you have to slowly push it such that you visualize on top, okay. then push it towards the uh, place where it has got tucked in and then once it's you've pushed it enough uh, where it's uh, the two haptics have come to the junction and then you tuck the other side right we shall go to the last video and there's going to be a lot of controversy there uh, we go on to dr arnav soria who is uh, currently doing his uh, ms ophthalmology from mmi 
MSR Ambala. Right? Am I right? Uh, no, ma'am. I'm currently doing my fellowship at Dr. Agarwal's Eye Hospital Chennai. Oh, that's why that video. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, good. Okay, I was wrong in here. I'm sorry for the wrong introduction. Yes, ma'am. That's so let's was... have you show your uh, video. The best for the last, huh? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, is my video visible, ma'am? Uh, the folder is visible. The video is not visible. Would you want to reshare? Doctor, you can stop share and then reshare. First open your presentation and then share, sir. Or should Dr. Mr. Sunil share it? We are all, last video, we are all. No, in... We are all, we are all. Right, done, done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very warm good evening to everyone. I humbly thank uh, the Academic and Research Committee and uh, uh, Dr. Chitra Murthy, ma'am and the respected panel. <laughs> Uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak among the doyens of ophthalmology. So uh, this 42-year-old female came to us with complaints of uh, unhappy vision uh, post uh, cataract surgery, or as we call it, refractive surprise, with a multifocal IUL operated elsewhere. On uh, careful refraction, the patient had a residual refractive error of uh, plus 2.5 ductus spherical with minus 4.25 cylinder at 1 on 5 axis. The uh, patient also gave history of uh, LASIK surgery done uh, elsewhere 15 years uh, back, which might have been the reason for uh, error in the IL power calculation and thus the refractive surprise. Patient was uh, planned for uh, left eye IUL explantation with reimplantation of new IUL uh, with pinhole pupilloplasty to bring down the higher order abrasions of around 1.194 to within the normal range of around 0.3 to 0.5. <coughs> this is the pentacam. As you can see, the higher order abrasions were to the range of 1.194, which are usually in 0.3 to 0.5 range. So first of all, the PCI is dislodged on the bag and under uh, viscoelastic cover, uh, it is brought interior to the rexis. Now, a three-piece IL is injected under the first IL into the capsular bag, which thus uh, it, the IL scaffold is used for uh, IL exchange. We've placed three piece IUL into the capsule bag. Now, carefully lifting up and holding the IUL, first IUL is cut with the micro scissors. In this case, uh, the IUL, the corrected IUL which lies behind, it acts as a scaffold and prevents any adherent trauma with the micro scissors to the posterior capsule. The bisected IULs can this be explained out first half and then the other half can be brought out. We make sure we check the parts of the aisle so that even we don't leave any broken haptics inside. Followed by this, we inject some intraocular pilocarpin to bring down the pupil size a bit. But this will not solve the problem of higher order abrasions that this patient with a cataract, uh, corneal and a cataract surgery had. So starting with, uh, we proceed to the full pass, uh, single pass full through pupiloplasty, a 30 gauge needle, uh, two paracentesis are created and a 10-0 polypropylene suture is attached to the long arm of the needle, which is introduced into the anterior chamber. The anterior chamber can also be maintained with the help of viscoelastics or in a uh, trocar anterior chamber maintainer. By railroad technique, it is brought out. So 
uh, the MST forceps are first introduced uh, through the paracentesis and the proximal iris leaflet is held. The suture needle is passed through the proximal iris tissue. A 26 gauge needle is introduced from the paracentesis from the opposite quadrant and passed through the distal iris leaflet after being held with an end grasping forceps. Next, the tip of the 10 0 uh, needle is passed through the barrel of 26 gauge needle, which is then pulled out of the paracentesis. The 10 0 needle exits through the anterior chamber along with this 26 gauge needle. Here we've uh, used a Sinsky hook through the paracentesis and a loop which is withdrawn is passed with four throws and thus the iris tissue is tight. This is repeated on the other ends and the loops are pulled inside the eye, thus approximating the tissue edges. We make sure that the Purkinje image is centered in the center of the pupil. After we've done and uh, being a novice surgeon, we, we do realize that uh, forming such a complex task uh, may not be very easy and the pupil size is too small. We use a, uh, we use a pinhole template actually to see the correction of vision uh, pre-op only so that uh, we see if uh, the patient is able to read better with a 1.5 mm pupil or with a 1 mm pupil. Once we've uh, realized that the pupil is too small and uh, the Purkinje images might not be centered, we can enlarge it using a vitrectomy, which enlarges up to 1.5 mm pupil. All through the process, endoilluminator also helps us in uh, clear visualization. Now we see that the Purkinje image is much better centered. This is the post-op day two image patient uh, who had a uh, vision uh, 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 the, with a retractive su surprise uh, and with the corrected IL, she was reading 6-6 six, six without glasses. These images show the steps of surgery. This is the image of the first uh, week post-op. Patient reads 6-6 six, six without classes. Thank you. Thank you very much. The concerns are um, pupillary dilatation if this patient has a retinal pathology. And uh, the other thing is, uh, did you uh, see after the IUL was removed, whether the aberrations had gone and then we could have looked at doing a pupilloplasty? Sometimes removal of the IOL is all that is needed because the corneal topography was all right. No, it wasn't an irregular cornea. Uh, Ma'am, uh, we can bring down the uh, uh, lower order operations usually get corrected, but uh, the higher order operations, uh, they usually don't settle down just with the uh, with the op with the power corrections. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I I think I should have had a relook at your topography. If the topography is all right, much of the higher order abrasions it could have been induced by the IUL and the diffractive rings or whatever it was in that situation. So it's a combination of both, cornea yes. as well as the lens. lens. Yes. Do you think this is the best case scenario for such a situation, the best uh, management plan? Any el anything else could have been done? And what about as the most important thing is this pupil, does, does it have any cosmetic implications? Will that pinpoint pupil, will it uh, have any cosmetic implication is number one. I don't know. You had to ask the patient. Number two, what about how, after putting a mid-reatic, how much it dilates your pupil, this one? Yeah. So, so studies are going on. We are, uh, we've been able to <laughs> diagnose and uh, we've been able to visualize the central uh, fundus very well. And with the help of uh, white field imaging techniques, mm -hmm. we've been able to uh, even uh, pictureize at least uh, the retina. If, if any, we make sure that uh, the patient does not suffer from any retinal pathologies. If any uh, patient uh, suffers due to some in uh, adverse. No, this patient had undergone yeah. a laser vision correction in the past. So yes, probably sir. for a myopia, right? Yes, sir. So obviously it's a risk, high risk for a retinal, I mean, peripheral breaks so and is, retinal detachment. Yeah. So it's, you may have an optos to image the periphery, but you have to treat the patient also, right? 
if there is no, a problem is it a reversible procedure that i would like yes, to know. Uh, i suppose uh, you... if the patient uh, first of all uh, or anything in the fundus you can't diagnose uh, but uh, can you reverse pupilloplasty using ndag laser we can actually uh, enlarge uh -huh. the pupil as well we've done in a few patients can you hear me we've actually done in a few patients we can cut the sutures am i heard yeah yeah, 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 yeah. video is not working audible man it it is a reversible procedure uh, we can cut the sutures and if required we can redo the surgery or using a yakpi we can any any uh, using a nd yak laser we can any time enlarge the pupil size uh, but so far uh, the patients have been very happy in the early post operative period uh, with uh, with low and uh, moderate light conditions as well uh, dr arna uh, i have a please go ahead Are you sure, Arna? Nani? Yes, sir. Hundred percent, sir. Please. Uh, I think uh, difficult situation and uh, challenging surgery with excellent results. But I have a very basic question, Doctor Arna. The sense that you know you had a plus two point. It was not just a multifocal, but it was a multifocal toric intraocular lens. And the residual error was plus two point five with minus four point two five cylinder, which means your spherical equivalent of the residual error is almost zero. which means you know uh, because you take half of the cylinder and uh, if you uh, they almost balance out each other it just means that the lens is not in the right place so if you had something like use something like astigmatismfix.com or uh, barrett uh, rx formula that would have given you an idea about where exactly to rotate the lens because i think this lens primarily needed some redistribution of the power and if you had done that maybe much of the problem could have been taken off just by repositioning the primary lens itself and uh, as was pointed out the topography though we just got a fleeting image it was not really looking too bad uh, though you showed some number as far as the higher order aberration is concerned the pentacam maps were not uh, is uh, uh, highly distorted so i believe that uh, you could have first uh, given a chance with the primary lens itself because the kind of residual error that you showed Uh, just uh, calls for a, a rotation of the lens i think uh, uh, i think one of the simple ways to test that is refraction if you just do a refraction and if the patient is happy uh, with the correcting refraction his vision he's happy then i think uh, like sir said the rotation and uh, uh, would be the best idea or uh, you know appropriate lens uh but i i i feel uh, like um, you know having a scaffolding in this situation i'm not very sure because you're creating more lesser space for you to maneuver the cutting of the iol so i would prefer to cut the iol and then uh, implant the lens uh the other thing is uh, in terms of uh, treating uh, abrasions on the cornea per se let's say if you're thinking about the patient has higher abrasions i would prefer to do a more of a corneal treatment uh, regularize the cornea first and then uh, you know go ahead instead of doing a such a invasive uh, a surgical maneuver which uh, like krishna pasad says said, said that these these are the patients who will have a lot of peripheral weakness retinal weakness and if you have to do the lasers there then you will have a big big challenge then you have to reverse the whole thing what you're doing then the patient is going to ask you then why do you do all of this for me if you're going to reverse it uh, sometime in the future so that's the that's the only worry i would say because and the more procedures you do for this patient he'll be very very angry because he's already done lasik he's done multifocal iol somewhere else now he's done uh, you know primary surgery like this and then uh, removing i mean releasing of the suture second surgery was done so there are multiple procedures it's better to uh, do as less surgery as possible in these cases because they have a higher risk of rd no my question to you dr arnav is did you even consider uh, repushing the lens the primary lens because i feel that was the, essentially the issue you had Yeah. so much the, residual lasting would have been the thing maybe an eye trace would have told you like no 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 uh, krishna prasad it's very simple it's <coughs> just refractive residual refractive error yeah, the plus spherical equivalent is almost zero yes minus 4.25 just just means that what you need is a re realignment of the lens yes, so that there is redistribution of the power yeah and also if there is a astigmatism already there for which the toric has been used even with a pinhole they may not get 66 unaided as it stated that is the problem and at the same time there is always a diffraction that comes in when you make the pupil 1 mm the diffraction also lets down the vision to a great extent so that is the problem of a very small pupil i think probably we could have even done an experiment after the putting a monofocal lens maybe put pilocarpine and see whether 
there is a change probably you could have experimented that and gone for an invasive procedure ma'am your voice is muted ma'am these are all very valid thoughts and uh, i totally agree but uh, i think we should conclude i think all of you are looking tired and most importantly don't you all agree with me that this was one uh, terrific webinar wonderful set of videos and you know i i wish i can keep repeating you all as an expert panel because all of you all were so energetic and wanting to give answers and so many right answers and uh, i actually want, i think most of the time i heard all of you so though we ended off late we are only uh, as good as the anchor amazing <laughs> yeah yeah whatever it was very nice and i think all of us also learned along the way with the wonderful combination of videos which we saw so three cheers to our expert panel and three 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 cheers to our speakers mm. for doing such a wonderful job every single video was very good and full of packed with learning as if you knew what we wanted for this webinar different kind of videos and they were all there together thank you so much and thank of you. course my dear dear friend satya ji it was there constantly constant support there for me and which probably pushes me further to do my best for all of you thanks so satya ji thank you ma'am and we thank all you, forward to coming to patna and enjoying your hospitality Yeah, and thank I you, would like to thank the AOS admin, Mr. Kripal, and the entire team for the sending the SMSs to you all on time. Our special thanks to Sai and Manjula from Neurotech for the way the inboxes get raided with my mails. But I'm sure uh, you understand the energy that I want to do my best for you all in my uh, term at ARC with all of you. And of course, I need to thank Mr. Sunil. I think he should take an exam for ophthalmology. The way he's there, <laughs> attending and participating. and soon he'll be telling us the number of people who watched the webinar so sunil's work doesn't end with the webinar he has to give me that homework also thanks a lot mr sunil and i need to also thank my uh, office guy who helps me all the flyers and everything will murugan is one major major energy walks from morning till night to so that i deliver the best for my arc and uh, finally and finally we have to thank entod for sponsoring all the arc programs on webinar in the last three years and three cheers to the entod also they, i don't even ask them nowadays it's just understood that they are there to help me and i think don't we all have to thank our attendees our uh, delegates who have been watching and i think uh, it is their presence and their numbers which makes me come keep coming back to all of you with these webinars and thank you all for smiling now i wish there was someone to take a photograph i'm not so smart at doing that i've taken ma'am i've taken oh, yeah thanks thanks post it on the uh, uh, facebook tomorrow i'll do that thank i'll put it in so the group much. thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you so much good night thank you thank you good night thank you 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 th